My name is Matt, and I am uh, the Adjuster TV guy. For the best tips and tools for getting on the first call list as an independent adjuster, hit the subscribe button. And, and don't hit the dislike button just yet, even though we had a technical issue. I apologize for that. I've been planning this thing all flipping day, and I've tested it five times. The audio worked every single time. You double check, make sure it's still going. You good? You good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. So if this is our first time meeting, if, you're, if you haven't watched a lot or any adjuster TV videos, my name is Matt. I am the, uh, I've been a, a cat property adjuster. I got my start back in 1999, um, working hail, wind, fire, hurricanes, you name it. And I've done, uh, worked at a carrier for a year. I have done roof sales. So you roofers out there, I got your number. I, I've seen the other side. I know, I know a little bit of that inside baseball. Um, I also have done daily claims, I've done deployed dailies, I've done a lot of stuff as a property insurance adjuster. I have never done auto really to speak of, so I, I can't really speak to that. So um, I retired in 2019 to do Adjuster TV full time, which has been super rewarding. Um, I love it. It's, it's the greatest thing. I really wish my mic was working because we got some background noise. Hopefully you guys can't hear that. Um, before we get started, I um, want to remind you that Adjuster TV is sponsored by uh, Kaplik. And Kaplik is an E&O insurance provider. e &O is errors and emissions. And it's basically, if you get called in the court over a claim that you handled, and the plaintiff, right, they say, hey, you know, so-and-so, Matt was the adjuster on this claim, and he was negligent. He screwed this up. Maybe there's some bad faith or whatever. Um, whether it's true or not, right, and uh, they're telling me that I'm I'm in trouble, you know, or they're they're wanting to, to drag me into court. What do I do? And they'll say, well, send us the letter, and we'll take it from there. And they will take it from there. So they also sell general liability insurance. Um, so you've got to have errors and emissions in insurance. I would say if you're brand spanking new, that the companies that you go work for, especially on cap, they're probably going to have some kind of a blanket coverage for you. But eventually, you're going to want to have your own because it will cover you no matter what. Some companies, some IA firms will add, if you don't have your own E&O insurance, they'll add $5 or $10 to your fee bill for e for, to pay for their E&O insurance, which is a blanket coverage that covers you. May not be as good, but who knows, right? You want to have your own. You kind of want to take that, that into your own hands. So you can go check them out at cplic.net slash TV. I'm all nervous now. Okay, we're good. Um, so we're also sponsored by Paysetter Claim Service. Paysetter Claim Service is a company that is headquartered in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they do claims nationally. And they, they do have a really, really big cap pr uh, presence. They do a lot of daily work. Um, encourage you to check those guys out at adjustertv.com slash paysetter, or you can go to uh, paysetterclaims.com, um, get on their roster, um, and let them know that Adjuster TV sent you. And also by Adjuster TV Plus, the last sponsor, um, we're going to be doing one of these um, sort of like claims walkthrough live stream videos with Q&A every single month starting soon for paying subscribers at adjustertvplus.com. And we're going to be doing not just hail, we'll be doing water claims, we're doing fence, you know, water spot on the ceiling, you know, uh, busted pipes, I mean, the whole nine yards. And, and, and every one of these claims is going to have a little bit of a policy discussion. And I'm going to go over kind of what we're going to, we're going to talk about. Um, there's a ton that I'm going to cover in this, this live stream. Um, so write down your questions, um, save them for the very end. Um, and we'll do a Q and A at the very end. You can put them in the chat, and I could scroll through that. But probably the best thing, so I don't miss it, is to wait until I say, "All right, we're going to do the Q and A now," and then pop your questions in. And then that way, I can just kind of like hit them rapid fire instead of hunting around, hunting through the the, the chat thing. Um, I'm also going to kind of go fast, so I'm going to cover a lot of ground. Um, this live stream is going to be available as a replay um, after this, probably tomorrow, and you can play it at half speed if you want to. You can hit pause. You can rewind, you know, if there's a section where like, what in the world, did, you know, I just, I didn't catch that he was going too fast, play it back at half speed. If you, if you still can't figure it out, send me an email at adjustertv.com slash contact. Say, hey, at minute 37, you said such and such. I didn't, I didn't catch that. I don't understand what you said. And I'll, I'll try to clarify for you. So I'm going to try to help you. We're going to cover a lot of ground. And ultimately what we want to do here is to kind of show the, the overall claims process and not just like, you know, Xactimate stuff, right? So in this training, we're gonna cover, 
Um, we're going to cover uh, what an FNOL is and kind of the basics of that, what it looks like, how you use it. There's going to be a little bit of policy consideration, a little bit of a, a you know, talk about endorsements and things like that. Um, we'll do a, a first contact with a homeowner, right? And it's, this is, if you've ever been in industry training, for some reason, I don't know why, this is like the most embarrassing thing when they, they make you stand up or people have to like, you know, pretend like they're the homeowner and the other guy's the adjuster and it's, it's we're going to do one of those, but it's just going to be me. So. Um, we will uh, document our file with that contact. Um, we're going to jump into Hover, and we're going to—that's kind of how we're going to do the scoping part of this. Is we've got a Hover 3D model, and we're going to kind of like walk around it, show what the pictures should look like that you need to take um, of every part of the house, and sort of the flow of scoping a loss, like a hail claim. Basically, this is going to be like a, a, just a roof claim, um, and then we're going to kind of do some basic claim setup and Xactimate. Um, with the claim info tab and parameters and all that kind of stuff, and then we'll we'll there's a sketch that came from this this hover diagram that we'll import into our our our, our uh, claim file that we're going to be using, and uh, um, we'll show how to get that in there. It's kind of the easiest way to do it, and uh, how to sort of work with that. Um, we, we will do. Uh, the estimate, writing a basic estimate for a roof. Um, we'll talk about macros for a little bit. Um, we'll talk about depreciation and how to apply that. Um, then we'll talk about how to settle up with the homeowner. Um, and then after you do all that stuff, you need, still need to document your file that you, you know, you've you've completed the estimate, you've completed the inspection, and you've uh, settled up with the homeowner. You can maybe negotiate with the contractor to get a agreed scope of pricing. Um, and we're going to document the file with those things. And at the end, then we'll do uh, Q&A. Uh, before we get started, the, the important thing I want you guys to get out of this and, and to, to remember as you're, as you're watching this, any training, right? And, and as you're on social media and you're saying, well, what training do I need to get next? Or what training do I need to get, period? You have to understand that Xactimate and CoreLogic and all those things, just like your, your tape measure and your ladder, these are tools, okay? They're, they're a, a small part of a greater sort of a suite of tools or a set of tools that you use in order to investigate a loss, a claim that a homeowner's made, just you know, do a coverage analysis, and then come up with a number for to do those repairs or replacement that makes sense to contractors like uh, you know our boy uh, Joe too in here in the chat. Um, you want it to, it's got to be realistic, right? For, for the Joe Twos out there in the world, you also have to understand that that the insurance has to pay for everything. I know this is hard to believe. PAs and, and contractors, are, what? Um, it's not remodeling insurance. It's not renovation insurance. It's insurance to get the, the homeowner to the pre-loss condition. Whatever it takes. Any any honest adjuster is going to tell you that you know, and they're going to try to get an agreed scope and pricing with the contractor on every claim that they can where there's coverage, right? We have limitations in a lot of ways. The policy is a binding contract between the carrier and the homeowner. We can't just, because there's some sort of a philosophical debate about you know, ridge cap and starter strip being included in the waste, that's not a hill that an adjuster is gonna die on, right? We're not gonna have philosophical debates about that kind of thing because we'll just end up in the weeds. And nothing can happen because the adjuster can't do anything about it. The adjuster's job is to, is to follow policy, carrier estimating guidelines, and get you know, the, the, the most amount of money that they can, for appropriate amount of money to close that claim so that the homeowner can get the work done so that it was worth it for them to have insurance in the first place, right? Um, so it's not enough to get Xactimate certified. Um, you have to understand um, that having knowledge of how to use Xactimate in the context of a claim is different than getting Xactimate certified certifications, right? The certifications are going to teach you how to do sketches in Xactimate. They're going to teach you um, the, the fundamentals of like where things are in Xactimate. You have to combine that with, with learning how to scope and learning real world construction, restoration construction, like what probably Joe T probably does on there. Um, in order to, to be able to use that tool to create an estimate that, that makes sense and is correct, as, close, as accurate as possible based on what you can see when you're there at the house the first time or the second or third time or whatever it is, right? Um, so 
in, in a way, it's you're kind of like learning how to train like you fight, right? So instead of like going to the gym and getting big and buff and then jumping in a boxing ring, you're going to get your rear end kicked, right? You need to learn how to box and then work on your physical fitness parts separately from that. But the main thing is you got to learn those skills, right? Um, so with Xactimate, with all this stuff, I'm going to be straight up honest with you. I'm not a master of this stuff. And there are very few adjusters that are truly like a master of every single thing. I'm probably going to do things that, that somebody, you know, with different skill sets going to look at and be like, what, what was he doing? Why didn't he use this thing? Or what, why, why, why? Totally fine. You can jump in the comments and tell me what I did wrong. No problem. The, the, but the thing, the key is, and it kept me busy and that kept me like doing really well at this work is that I used the tools to get to that bottom line number that me and Joe too are going to stand there in the front insurance front yard and talk about and make sure that we agree on, right? However I get there is not as important as getting a, a, a nodding head, right? I have to follow the rules, but if I, if I don't use sketch to do interior damage and I just like hand do it, um, and it's fa that's faster for me, then I'm going to do that, right? So Xactimate, just because you can do things in Xactimate or core logic doesn't mean that you absolutely need to unless the carrier or the firm says we need you to sketch every single thing which some of them do right but not every one of them does so all that being said let's jump into this all right so our our basic uh um yeah joe two already already with the ridge cap and the so i just want to make sure that we're we're on the right screen here so um We're going to do me in the corner. All right, so this is uh, basically an FNOL, right? Um, we're going to call the insurance company Acme Insurance because I don't think there's actually one called Acme Insurance. We're just going to that's what we're going to do. Um, FNOL stands for First Notice of Loss, and that's basically um, when the homeowner calls in or the, the property owner, whether it's a commercial or a residential, when they call in and they say, Hey, you know, we had a big hail storm. We think we have damage to the roof. Um, I guess we need to file a claim or something, right? So then the person that, that does intake is going to collect their information, get their policy number, and set up a claim for them. And then they're going to send out a, a, a basically a, a loss report um, that says most of the important things that you as the adjuster is going to need, are, you're going to need to know, right? So you need to know the date of loss, right? Because they may call in and say, um, you know, well, we didn't really have a storm with, you know, but last summer we did, and for some reason, it got included with this particular cat, right? You're you're here for a cat from March fifteenth, twenty twenty two, and the homeowner may be in the area, but didn't you know doesn't have any damage from this cat, but they have some from the old cat, right? So you see that data loss in there. You might call your manager and say, hey, you know, this is the wrong data loss. You know, um, do, should I be getting this file? Give them the claim number and your, your manager, your IA manager, by the way, don't call your carrier manager. I don't care what they say. I don't care how many times they say, oh man, oh yeah, open door policy here. You know, here's my cell phone number. Do not call anybody at the, at the carrier, the carrier store manager, any of those people. Do not call them. Call your IA team manager first before you do anything, okay? Um, just double checking here. I want to make sure that... We don't have any more snafus. Um, so um, that being said, um, data loss, right? The insured's name, Barb and Kenji Dahl, get it? Uh, the insured's address, which is may or may not be the same as the loss location, right? So if these things are different, you wanna make sure that you don't put in your mapping software the insured's address when you need, when it, this is different, this might be three doors down, it might be a rental property that they have. Uh, they might have power of attorney over like, you know, who, you, don't, you don't have no idea until you start talking to this person. But this might be different. You wanna make sure that you go to the lost location and you confirm this lost location when you call them, which we're gonna do in a minute, right? Um, hopefully you've got at least two phone numbers on there. Um, if, not to go too deep into this, but if you start calling these phone numbers and you, you get uh, no answer, Right? Or it says, you know, it's a, it's a wrong number you call and it's, it's not Barbie doll. It's, uh, you know, somebody else. You know, Porky Pig. I don't know why it's Disney. It's, is that even Disney? I don't know. Um, 
if it's somebody else, they have no idea who Barb Dahl is, um, then you need to, to find the right phone number so that you can t contact this person, right? So you will, you'll contact the agent. Um, I don't have it on here, but there should be an agent's contact information on a first notice of loss, right? Uh, email, if, you know, if you're having trouble with phone numbers, you can shoot them an email real quick and then pick up, like email Barbie Dahl and then call the agent and say, hey, you know, I, sent, I, I tried calling, the number was wrong, I sent, I, I sent her an email, but I wanted to make sure I got in touch with her over the phone. Do you have an updated number for this person, right? And they'll give it to you, most likely. Um, they'll have a little loss description, all right? So hail damage to dwelling. Um, they may have nothing here. The intake person may not have cared, or you, you might just get like this, this super duper short. You know, it says hail damage to dwelling, and then you come to find out they have like five outbuildings and a fence and a whole bunch of stuff that's they could have mentioned on here, right? Um, now, as far as like uh, endorsements and modifications, it probably won't say modifications, but I put that on there um, just to sort of illustrate that endorsements are there to uh, modify the policy, right? So everybody has, so in this case, these guys have a HO3, which is also not on here, but the, it'll, it should say something like, uh, you know, policy form HO3, right? So we wanna, you're not gonna find endorsements in the policy, the policy, so the HO3 policy is going to have is, is sort of like the, the the canvas that the endorsements and things are layered on top of, right? Um, so you want to be just to take a quick look at these things. You know, one of the main ones, which I had, a, I had a, a couple of claims go sideways on me, uh, big claims like a, a fire and out with like a forty by sixty outbuilding, and I told the homeowner that. You know, we're talking about the, getting an inventory list for all the personal property. They had tons, they used it as storage. They had ton, tens of thousands of dollars, over $100,000 worth of personal property items in this building and it burned to the ground, right? Covered loss. Um, but I was like, yeah, you know, so just make your inventory list. And then once you get all the circuit notes replaced, you know, come back to us and we'll send you checks for the replacement cost, right? I kept saying that. Well, it turns out, let's take a little quick look here. Uh, let's see if I can find it. This is the HO3, right? If we do a control F and we go actual cash value, we're going to see um, that under loss settlement right here. You guys can see that okay? Um, it says property of the following types, personal property, right? Right here. You know, it's hard to see, but it's right there. Um, awnings, carpeting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Structures that are not buildings, like fences maybe, um, these are to be settled as follow, fo follows at actual cash value at the time of the loss. But it says, but not more than the amount required to repair or replace. What that means is, is that those are actual, those are ACV only items. Okay, so on the HO3, which is the base policy that most people have, um, a lot of people only have an HO5, um, with the HO3, Personal property is is actual cash value only. There's no they can't get the, the second check because it's not allowed under the policy. However, everybody and their mom that gets homeowners insurance has something called a PPRC or something like it. It's called personal property replacement cost endorsement. Right, it's additional coverage that gives them replacement cost for their personal property. You can find it on the deck page. Um, you can look on the deck page, you probably can exact analysis or some sort of like claims management system and see PPRC or, you know, contents, replacement costs or RC, something like that, right? You'll be able to find it. Um, this, the claim that I had that went sideways and I was telling them all that stuff, my manager called me one day and said, hey, are you, uh, um, did you check the, the deck sheet on this one? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, I don't, I'm not seeing a, a PPRC on there. I was like, oh no, what do you mean? Got in there and looked and they had, it was not on there. Called the homeowner, actually I called the agent um, first to double check. I was like, hey, listen, we, we don't have the personal replacement, personal property replacement cost endorsement on this particular policy and they have a big claim with a lot of contents. Guy double checked. Yeah, no, they declined it, right? So when, when something, with something like this, um, and when I called the homeowner, they, they exploded. I mean, it was, it was not a good scene. 
Um, and I think if, when it was all said and done, we had to do something special with it since I kept promising that we were going to pay them replacement cost. I can't remember. It's been a few years. Um, but whenever a homeowner declines something that's a super obvious one like that, like PPRC, they have to sign a piece of paper. They have to like, actually write their name down on the piece of paper saying, I decline coverage for personal property replacement costs because they want to save $91 a year or whatever it costs additional for, for the, that particular endorsement. It's not a whole lot. You'll often see this with um, sewer and drain backup claims where the, where the homeowner declines they're offered it. Whenever they get their policy, if they're in an area where it's, it's offered, they will be offered it when they're sitting there or they're over the phone doing the, you know, signing up for that particular policy. Um, so look for these things. The 400R, um, this is again kind of another made up endorsement um, that I made up for an actual cash value roof coverings endorsement. In some parts of the country, um, there's two ways you might see this. Uh, either A, in some parts of the country like Colorado, certain counties in Colorado, maybe the whole state, um, some companies won't insure for replacement costs for roofs that have that are wood shake. It doesn't matter if it's brand new or 50 years old, they will only pay ACV only on roof covering. So you, you may not be able to, you know, that's what you just may have to deal with, right? But most people will take the money that they get for replacing the ACV check that they get for doing the... Um, would shake and then they'll just buy comp with it, right? Um, or the homeowner had an old torn up roof and underwriting happened to do an underwriting review audit. They pulled out some files and drove around and just kind of like, well, do they have a tree house? Do they have a pool with no fence? What's the roof look like? And they drove by this person's house and saw that the roof was, you know, that it was in shambles. It was falling apart and looked like you could just walk up there and just like scoop it up in your hands and, you know, it's, it's like just, it's, it's well beyond, you know, uh, lived at its useful lifespan. Um, so they will go in and they'll say, all right, well, we're not insuring that. We might not insure it at all, or we'll insure it as a ACV only, right? Well, it, it may be that, you know, in, in this case, and this is pictures here in a little bit, the homeowner, they replaced the roof, right? So they have a, a one-year-old roof or a three-year-old roof, and, but they nobody told the insurance company, and so they still have this 400R on their ACV roof coverings. Call your manager, say, hey, listen, I'm at, standing up on this one. It's pretty much a brand new roof, and they've got a 400R on it. Is that supposed to be there? You know, and then we get the agent involved. It may be that it's there for some other reason, um, or that they can take it off, right? So, when you're going through your loss reports, um, you need to be double checking all these things and just kind of like making a note of things. I'm going to write down, you know, put check marks or make notes next. To, I'm going to print all these things out, right? I'm going to make notes next to everything. Um, when you call the homeowner. You want to make sure that you double check, you know, their mortgage company. Um, so you're going to, you know, hopefully they have something written here. If they don't, you're going to ask them, right? You're going to double check the deductible. Um, when, you, when you're talking to a homeowner, um, you don't necessarily need to, like, ask them about their deductible or talk about it particularly. Your main, and we'll kind of jump into that here just in a second, but your main goal is to set up an appointment, see if you, make sure you've got all the details of the claim that you need to do the, your inspection and then give them their contact info, set up expectations for next steps, and then move on down the road, right? Um, double, I always double check the, the dwelling limit um, because sometimes this might be something like $3.5 million, right? Or it might be $35,000. So that's going to be a significant difference in how, probably the amount of time it's going to take me to do that claim. A little $35,000 house in the middle of a cornfield in Nebraska, you know, maybe a little you could walk around it in 60 seconds or, you know, a great big gigantic house that has a million different roof facets. I'm going to spend a lot more time on that big one than I'm on the little one, depending on the damage, but generally speaking. Um, so I'm going to be looking at these, this information here, right? And then you got to always check the priors before you, I would say before you call the homeowner, I'm going to um, send out, a, usually you can send out an email. You might be able to look these up in exact analysis and say, you know, these are unrelated. Or they, they had the roof replaced, they were paid $27,000 to replace the roof um, two years ago, right? That might be relevant, you know, because you're gonna, you're gonna wanna go, when you get up on the roof, it might be falling apart, and it's obviously not a two-year-old roof. Now, that may, that may bring up an issue. So you always wanna check prior claims. Um, most of the time, they're not related in unless you're in like a, a really heavily hail-prone area. Um, No, I can't look at this comments, you guys. 
save that stuff for the end. And again, we're not having philosophical like roofer, roofer theory, you know, PA theory, none of that stuff. This is just claims process, right? Um, so anyway, um, hopefully at the bottom, you know, you're going to see uh, or some, somewhere on the loss report, um, you'll see some extra notes, right, that, that the, the intake person may have, may have done. Um, right, so they may say, well, the insured said her neighbors have hail damage, a roofer says she needs a new roof, grill cover has holes in it, right, so that kind of thing. Um, so when I call this person, I'm going to have gone through all this stuff and looked at it and made sure I know, you know, there aren't any surprises on here. And I'm going to call them and say, hey, my name is Matt, I am your adjuster from Acme Insurance Company, and I'm looking for Barb or Kenji Dahl. Are you, you know, can I speak to them, please? Um, instead of calling and saying, Hi, is Barb or Mr. or Mrs. Dahl there? You're probably going to get hung up on 30% of the time. You get people because it's, it's a telemarketer, right? Um, identify yourself immediately. I'm your adjuster. My name's Matt, and I'm with your insurance company. I'm with State Farm. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, the, you know, in their mind, they're thinking, oh, this is going to be the person that's going to come out and write us a check, right? So you have much less chance of getting hung up on if you identify yourself immediately. Um, but I'm going to go through, like, um, I've been assigned to a uh, hail damage claim, right? So I've checked off the damage um, for Barb and for Mr. and Mrs. Dahl, checked off the insured's name, hopefully that's right, and you'll get corrected if it's not, um, to your property at 12345 Elm Street in Kalispell, is that right? Right? So I, I've, I've gotten the lost location, I got the name, I got the, um, the, the damage type, so I've just checked off three things right there, so I can, you know, we're good to go there. Because it might, it might be that the lost location's wrong, um, it's, you know, well, it's not actually Barb and Kenji, it's uh, the, the trust that so-and-so has set up for whatever, right? So you, you want to get these details. Um, and then I'm going to um, double check their cell phone number. And then I'm going to ask them, I'm going to say, hey, listen, you know, you guys, it says here you guys, you guys have hail damage. Um, have you noticed anything specific around the property that, that, you know, you feel like we need to take a look at, right? So I'm going to immediately go for... You know, just give me a little bit deeper description. They've already probably said the description three times. They called the, the intake person, they had asked that. They may have, somebody else may have called them. So you want to not make it to where it's like a, a big deal. Tell me exactly everything, right? You just want to say, if there's anything else I'm seeing here, you know, we need to check out the roof, um, sides of the house probably. You know, you guys have a wood fence or anything? So you want to kind of like, Ask them some leading questions to stimulate them to say, yeah, well, we noticed damage to the deck and there's some window frames that have some damage and da 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 And I'm writing that down on my, my loss report. Um, I'm going to verify the, the mortgage company. Um, shows here that you guys have Big Bank of America as your mortgage company. Is that still correct? Um, yes. Okay. They might say, well, why is that? Uh, well, I'll say, you know, we just, you know, we just need to verify that the mortgage company is correct. Um, you know, when we get out there, we'll talk more about it, you know. Don't necessarily need to go in, into great depth about that. Um, and then I'm gonna already have like decided when I'm gonna do this particular claim. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna say, all right, well, the next time I'm gonna be in your neighborhood is gonna be nine o'clock on Tuesday, March 29th. Um, is that, you know, that's, that's my next available time to come out and take a look at, at, at properties in your neighborhood. Um, nine times out of ten, they'll say, yeah, that's, that's fine. Or do we have to be there? Um, or I really want my contractor there. That's no problem. Can you give me your contractor's name and phone number, and I'll get that information. I'll write it down on here. Um, and then, you know, there may be a few other little, like, things that you want to cover in here. Um, I'm not going to be like, what's your dwelling limit? I'm showing here your dwelling limit's 350000 It's totally irrelevant. Um, you, if, if there's a prior loss that you, when you did your, your, prior, your prior research, um, you may say, you know, I'm showing here in our records that you had a claim from uh, two years ago for hail damage. You guys get that taken care of? Yep. Okay. Cool. So they said on here we it was paid and they replaced the roof, right? Um, so then that becomes probably irrelevant, right? And then I'm going to get off the phone. Do you have any questions? Uh, okay. If you, listen, if you have any questions going forward, you know, between now and our appointment at, at 9 a.m. on Tuesday, here's my cell phone number. Give my cell phone number. Give me a call. Um, if you need to change that, um, you know, if you can't be there and you really, really want to be there, whatever, just give me a call. I'm going to call your contractor right now and let him know when I'm going to be there. And then we'll, uh, we'll talk to you, you know, at 9 o'clock on, on Tuesday morning. And then that's pretty much all I'm going to do, right? Um, so 
Hold on a second. <clears throat> After I do that, then I'm going to jump into Xactimate, and I'm going to um, do a couple things in um, the software. I'm going to double check all this stuff, uh, that make sure that the, the property address is correct. I'm going to make sure the data loss is correct. Um, the date contacted is very, very important. You don't want to do the date contacted and the date inspected until after you've done those things, right? So don't say, all right, well, I'm going to go look at it on March 29th, which is next week, and then get in here and type in March 29th. Because if it's going to tell exact analysis that you already inspected the loss right now, the next time it uploads and, and double and checks in with the, uh, you know, because this is always like doing the cloud thing, I guess. Um, so you don't want to do that because it's going to show up in your list and, you're, and then you're going to have a big gap between when that, it says that you inspected it and when you actually do inspect it, when you, when you finally close the claim a week later, and your manager's gonna call you and say, hey, listen, what's the deal with all these claims? It looks like you inspected them all on the same day, and uh, none of them are closed. You're, gonna have to you're not gonna have any idea if you don't know this, right? So don't click those things until you've actually done them, right? And we'll do that here in a second. Um, I'm gonna scroll down for claim rep. Um, if you don't have anything in there, which you may not if you, this is your first one, um, click on the little lines, and I'm going to click Add over here, right? I'm going to type in Matthew Allen, and it's going to make, create a quick code for me, right there. Uh, put your number in, put your you know other information or whatever, and hit OK. And then I'm going to select it, hit OK, and there it is. And it's going to put me as the claim rep and the estimator. You might just be the estimator. Right. You might not be the actual claim rep if you're doing photo and scope or scope only or it's, it's a task assignment or something like that. Either way, you'll, uh, you, know, you can call your manager and ask him if that's, you know, or it might be in your orientation documentation. So big, you know, big Bank of America was the mortgage company, right? And then we're going to go up to the next tab, which is coverages and loss. I'm going to double check that this stuff matches what I have on my FNOL. And then I'm going to drop in the deductible. Now, back to the FNOL, right? So we saw that on here that we have deductible was $1,000, and then there's a WH 1%, right? So that means that 1% of 350 is a wind and hail deductible, right? So whatever that is, 3,500 bucks. Come on, math whizzes. I always use a calculator, so don't beat up on me about. It. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, oh, thirty-five hundred bucks. Right, so it's a thirty-five hundred dollar uh, deductible. This is a wind and hail claim, right? So unfortunately, it's going to be a thirty-five hundred dollar deductible. They may or may not have these coverages in here, but you can type in three fifty, right? Uh, other structures is typically, unless it's specifically noted otherwise, it's going to be ten percent of dwelling contents we said it was fifty thousand dollars right i'm doing all this now as i as i'm doing my going through my claims right and just sort of a, to back up one step i'm gonna make all my phone call i'm gonna make my build my whole schedule in one go using the map and like writing things down and you know writing on each 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 loss report when i want to do that one right and then i'm going to call everybody right so i'm going to go through and call everybody make notes and then I'm going to start over with that stack, and I'm going to go in and do all this stuff, right? So I'm going to break things up into chunks like that. Like basically, I, I call it time blocking, which is not an original term, but that's, that's what I'm calling it. Um, so because I'm doing this kind of thing right now, it means I don't have to do it in the field later when I'm sitting in front of the homeowner's house, and I want to try to close that claim on site, which is what I do. But that's just me. All right, parameters, you want to make sure that you have the most recent price list. So March 2022 20, is the most recent price list. Um, if it's an old price list, if it's a reinspection and it's like three months old or a year old or two month, one month old, or whatever, you want to make sure that it's the current month when you're going to be writing that estimate. Um, the rest of this stuff, um, your opening statement and closing statement and the header should all have been put in when you went through orientation or when you, your computer was set up to work with this cap. So I'm not going to jump into that. Um, then I'm going to go down to documents and go to report management. And I'm going to put in, and this may be different 
depending on who you're working for, but, but the, the broad strokes of this are the same. This is the, the claims process, right? You, because you contacted Barbie Doll, you have to document that so that when somebody else goes back in there later, if Kenji Doll calls in and says, hey, nobody called, a, you know, nobody called us, I don't understand, where's my adjuster, da da da, da they're gonna go straight to your activity diary and, and in exact analysis or in the claims management system and see did they note that they made contact, what was said and everything. And if you've got a diary in there, like the video that they do, then the person who's on the phone, which is gonna be your manager, is gonna say, hey, well, it looks like, uh, looks like Matt talked to uh, Barb two days ago at four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, is there anything else I can help you with? He set, he set up an appointment for 9 a.m. on Tuesday. Do you want me to have him call you or whatever it is, right? Instead of, oh, well, I don't see anything in the file. He must not have contacted you. You're in trouble if, if that happens. So you always have to document your file. Um, you can set these up separately, right? So let's say uh, first, and you can do a little bit of a, there's a little bit of auto-populate contact, right? And first contact with insured. What I want. Um, so on this one, called ensure a time of 4 p.m. Number called is 555-1212. Um, and you can delete this out if you even if it's not right. You can so you can say uh, spoke. I'm not going to do the whole thing here, but you basically say spoke with first and last name of the person you spoke with, Barbara Doll. Um, she stated. X, Y, Z, uh, about the claim, right? Appointment, inspection, appointment set for 9 a.m., 3.29, Tuesday, right? Roofer, or con you say contractor, right? In some companies will say KTOR for some reason. Um, contractor is Joe two, uh, and his number is five 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 one three one two, whatever. Right. And you hit save. And as soon as you hit save, then it's locked in. Right. You can obviously change that until this thing gets it connects with the exact analysis in the cloud and does the the cloud stuff. Um, but it's in there. You've documented this file. Um, so let's see what we got here. Okay. Now let's. Tuesday 9 a.m. rolls around, you walk up to the insured's house and you say, I'm gonna knock on the door and I'm gonna say, um, uh, Madison, this is a property claim. Um, so I'm gonna knock on the door and be like, hey, I'm Matt, I'm uh, your adjuster with you know, Adjuster TV Insurance or whatever it is, and I'm here to take a look at the house. Um, I've already set my ladder up, I've already taken my risk photo and the address photo and I walk up and I knock on the door. and while I'm uh, talking to them, I'm gonna kind of go back over, I have my first one, my FNOL printed out and it, all my notes are on it that it took when I was on the phone with them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, you know, uh, just double check, you know. And the other thing I, f I forgot to say, when I'm on the phone with them, I'm always gonna ask how old the roof is or how old the thing that they're, they're gonna, they're saying has the most damage, like the biggest thing, so the roof. So I'm gonna say, when I'm on that phone call, while I'm, you know, sitting there in my, hotel room or whatever, I'm going to say, oh, do you have any idea real quick how, what the age of your roof is? And if somebody, you know, you get a varying answers, a lot, most people will know. Some people, if they don't know, it's because they, they bought the house and the home inspector didn't know, but he guesstimated that it was five years old. Well, they said it was five years old when we bought it and it's, that was five years ago, right? So that's, that's the number I'm going to use, right? I'm not going to try to like get up on the roof and say, well, you know, it's actually, it actually looks like it's, you know, six years old or it's 26 years old. The age is the age. I'm going to go with what they said. The condition is where you say, well, this roof is not aging well. It's a certain teed horizon. Joe too knows, knows what that is. Uh, it's falling apart. It's only 10 years old. You know, that's the condition of the roof. That's going to have an effect on how you, how you scope that roof as well and how much depreciation you're going to apply to it. It's not going to, it's not going to dictate whether it's covered or not unless there's something that you're told to do or there's some sort of endorsement, which I've never seen, right? If you go out to the insurance house and everything's old and everything's falling apart, if there's damage on it, if it has damage, pay for it, right? Don't sit there and say, well, you know, this is, it's too old. I've had, I've had adjusters say that to me when I was, when I was selling roofs, uh, which I, I don't know if I, you guys heard because the mic was off. Anyway, um, 
Don't do that. Pay if, if you pay for it, it doesn't matter how old or what condition it's in. That's what the depreciation is for, right? Um, okay, so now let's jump into Hover real quick and um, take a look at our house, all right? So here's the front side of the house, right? Nope, this is the front side of the house, right? So real quick, um, when I go around a house, I'm going to go usually uh, counterclockwise, right? Just because out of habit, some people will go always go clockwise. I would always go to the left first. Um, the way I remember it, and I didn't, it didn't take long for it to, to be a thing that you remember, but if you go front, right, back, left, you could say that that's like an acronym for furball. Uh, it sounds dumb, but in my mind, I was like, that's kind of like, it's like furball without the nouns. Uh, or if you go the other way, it's flurb, right? I mean, it's whatever it takes, right? But you always want to go the same way every single time because that's where your, your file accuracy is going to greatly improve if you're always doing the same thing, repeating your moves. It's like boxing, right? You, you, every time that you take a swing at a guy, you're not just standing there with your hands down, you're going to get knocked out. Your hands automatically go back up. That's one of your moves, right? With this, you're doing, you're, you're, you're moving around a building exactly the same way every single time. And you're going to, when you, as you're doing each elevation and each slope, you're, you have a pattern at which you look at everything so that you don't miss anything. So Joe 2 doesn't crawl down your shirt because you missed all the window wraps on the back side of the house or whatever, right? So I'm, gonna, I'm always going to go, I'm going to start at this left corner over here. I'm sure you can see that. Uh, I'm going to start at the left corner. And I'm going to start at the top and look at the fascia. It's, there's no gutters on this one, so it's fascia only. And I'm going to look at, look at the, with the light on it. And if I see damage, I'm going to take a picture. If I don't see damage, I'm going to take a picture to show no damage. I'm not going to take a million pictures, but I'm going to take some, right? So my picture might look like, you know, well, let's back up real quick. My risk photo, I will probably grab that as my risk photo. Stand back by the curb, take a picture, right? And then I'm, if the house number is on the front side of the house right there, I'm going to get right up on it, 75 or whatever it is, right? And then I'm going to walk up to the door and talk to the homeowner. So then I can go over here. I might, I'll might, i probably still come back over here and get another front of risk photo from this other corner, right? Just so, and, and you want to see a little bit of that left side. This is going to help the desk people and the QA people later on. The more pictures you have, I shouldn't say the more pictures you have, but the better pictures that you have of things that show more stuff, the better off you're going to be. So I'll take a picture of this fascia, right? So I'm going to, whoa. I'm going to get a, try to get a shot of it with the sun kind of like shining on it so you can see if it has dents or not. And it's pretty obvious when you, when you look at it. If it's going to be gutters, then you look at the bottoms of them, right? And again, if you look at it with the light shining a certain way, you can see the, the, the dimples on the bottom of the gutters. Then I'm going to look at this brick. And even though Joe too might think that this is, you know, we're paying for brick, we're not paying for brick. It's ice hitting it. If a tree hits it and it puts, it crunches it all, yeah, of course. But ice balls, I don't care how big they are, ice is not harder than rock. It just isn't. Um, unless it's super duper old and super duper falling apart, and in which case it's probably not insurable anyway. Uh, then I'm going to look at the windows. I'm going to look at the screens. I'm going to look at the frames of the windows. And I'm going to look at um, whether or not those frames are... The sashes, like if the sashes are damaged or the frames of the windows themselves are window wraps, and that's going to help me write an estimate for that damage. If you see that the, the actual the physical frame of the, of the window is damaged that's attached to the building, you're probably going to be buying that whole window, right? If it's just the screens and there's little dings in the frame of the screen, don't be buying a all, bunch of windows just by the screens because right? the screens are replaceable. Even though big pain in the rear end. If, there's, if the glass is broken, that's again a point of contention with some contractors and depending on where you are in the country, it may be, you know, there's they're double or triple pained. You know, you're gonna, that in situations like that where you're gonna be talking about, um, well, we're gonna replace this whole window because the glass is broken um, or we're just gonna reglaze it. That's a question that I'm gonna probably try to involve Anderson Windows or, or Pella or whoever makes these windows and, you know, talk to them specifically. I'm going to get my manager, my, my IA team manager involved because windows can get super duper expensive. If, they're, if, if we own, we own. We're going to pay for it. 
Um, but if they can be repaired reasonably, then that's what the policy tells us to pay for. And again, that's the contract between the homeowner and the insurance company, not philosophical, you know, roofer theory stuff. It's that's what we have to go by, right? So I'm gonna work my way around the house, looking up, and then working my way down. You know, you, on the front side of the house, you know, you may have, uh, you know, they may have some lights on the front. I'm gonna check the tops of those. Those little, sometimes they're metal or plastic. They may have a dent or a hole in the metal. Um, and then any little vent covers, you're not going to see a whole lot of vents, and you, and you shouldn't see, except for in rare places, um, downspouts on the front side of the house for aesthetic reasons. They'll put them off to the side. Like this, if there's a gutter here, this gutter may drop into this gutter, and then they put a, a, a downspout over here on this side, right? So you, you, generally speaking, you're not doing downspouts on the front either. We'll move around to the right side, right? And I'm going to get an overview shot. And I'm not going to go all the way around this thing because we don't have all the time in the world. Um, but I'm going to get an overview shot that shows some of the front and then all of the right side of that house. And I'm going to do the exact same thing I did. I'm going to take pictures of everything that could possibly be damaged, if it's damaged or not damaged. And then I'm going to go around to the back side, right? But before I hit the back, I'm going to take one more shot of that right side just to get it from a different angle showing some of the back, just to help the people. I'm not going to take 15,000 pictures of downspouts. We're just gonna, we, we wanna give the, the desk people uh, who may be dealing with this claim later on down the road, QA, enough to look at this, to, to be able to make, you know, further decisions on this particular claim. And I'm gonna do the same thing on the back. I'm absolutely gonna look at that garage door. If I got this, this fascia is all dinged up and you can clearly see it's got the, the dents from the hail coming and hitting it, I'm double checking these. On garage doors, the place where it's gonna be dented is on these corners at the top, anything that, that has a corner that faces like upwards, like so, something on the bottom is probably not going to have a dent on it except from like a golf ball or a soccer ball or a basketball. But if they have dents on the tops here, um, a strong case can be made that those are hail damage. If they have dents all over the place, I mean, it might have been coming in sideways and it's dented everywhere, you know, and it's, it's they're spattering with it and it matches the dents and other things. I'm 100%, I'm not fighting on the garage door, I'm totally going to buy it. Also. You want to look at this frame because this frame around the garage door might be metal and it's like a window wrap, right? So there's an overhead and we'll look in the, in Xactimate. Um, actually, we'll look in Xactimate right now. Oh, no, you didn't. Um, oh, shoot. Um, stand by. I'll use that password real quick. Um, anyway, I'm glad I saw that now. So we're going to where am I looking here? Um, there's a there's line items in there for this metal wrap, right? Um, it's by could be by the opening, like it might be like a double sized garage door opening, and the same thing for the door, you know, double sized garage door uh, or a single overhead door, um, and then we'll keep moving around. They've got a door on the back side of the house. Um, the reason why I don't think that this is the front side of the house, um, even though there's a door here that looks like a, a front door, a lot of places have garages on the back. But the number one thing that tells me is they have all these these gables on the front, right? And this is an indication that this is the, the street facing side. So, you know, if you're questioning whether or not, you know, well, the garage door is always on. The, it's not always on the front. Um, and we just keep moving around the house taking photos. I'm going to get another photo back of the, the back side of the house this way. Um, and then finish up here on the left side of the house, right? So I'm going to get an overview shot of the left. Oops. Come on, computer. Uh, and then I'm going to do my, I'm going to scope it exactly the same way, top down. You're probably going to find dryer vents um, and stuff like that sticking off the side, the back the right, back, and, and left sides of the house. Um, and you're gonna, you wanna take a look at those because a lot of times the pail is big enough it's gonna damage those. They might be plastic or metal. And then once I get back down around to the front, my ladder is gonna be set up right here in this, probably in this corner because that's the easiest spot to get up. You could put the ladder right here and walk up there. But for me, chances are this is in the grass. My ladder is gonna be right there. So I'm gonna climb up to the top of this ladder 
I'm going to take photos of my uh, pitch gauge. I'm going to get my pitch. And I'm going to make sure that I put my pitch gauge on one of these, right? Uh, set the pitch gauge on there because the shingles, as they overlap, they're not the same pitch as the actual pitch of the roof because they have to overlap each other. So they have something underneath holding up one end of it. So you want to go from edge to edge to edge of those shingles and that's going to give you an accurate pitch. Also, you can absolutely uh, put your pitch gauge on the fascia, right? And on a roof like this, you're probably going to want to like check it in multiple places. Um, I'm going to do, I'm going to check the number of layers that are on this roof. I'm going to um, do my shingle gauge and all that stuff. I'm going to check if there's, if there's valley metal in this valley, all before I ever get on the roof. Um, once I do all those things, then I'm going to start taking photos of this roof. And I'm going to do my roof exactly the same way as I do my elevations, right? So I'm going to start on the front, do everything I need to do in the front, take all the photos I need to do on the front, scope the front, and then when I'm done with the front, I'm going to move to the right. So I'm going to front, right, back, left, front, right, back, left, fur ball, fur ball, fur ball, all right? That's, that's what I'm going to do every single time. I'm not, this is what I'm not going to do, and this is probably more important, or at least as important as um, what to do. And that is, um, I'm not going to go up to the peak, right? And uh, look around and take some, you know, oh, there's an overview of the back, you know, that little back duck pyramid thing over the garage. And I'm going to take a picture of the front over corner over here and then take a bunch of random photos. And maybe I'll start my test square on this less slow because it, I think that's the, the uh, side that the damage came in. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be systematic. And this is the, the number one way. Even if you got Joe 2 there and he's like right on your hip, pointing at stuff, you know, asking you questions, chatting you up or whatever, I'm going to do it exactly the same way every single time. Um, so I'm going to start on the front. I'm going to take overview photos and I'll show you a little bit closer to that. Um, I have to reset my password and exact to me, so hang on a second. Okay, so and then I'm gonna once I get all that stuff, um, I'm going to go to the right slope, right? And we'll do exactly the same thing in the right slope, and then we go to the back slope and do this exact same thing. And basically, what I'm gonna do on every single slope, starting with the front, because by the time we get back to the left slope. I have all my photos, I have my full scope, I'm ready to get off this roof if I don't have the measurements, uh, or I'm ready to diagram and measure it, right? And this is actually a super easy roof, Angela, to uh, diagram and measure, or at least to wrap your brain around. So I like to take, on a roof like this, I might go down here to this corner and uh, stand somewhere in this, in this area and shoot my photo back up towards the peak, right? And get a shot from that side. And then I'm gonna go over to the other side and do it again. Or it might be better on this roof, big, big hip like this is to go, start to walk up to the peak. And while you're walking up, you're kind of probably looking at like, seeing if there's any spots on this thing, if you see any hell damage. And I'm gonna take a picture um, that way. And then I'm going to take one that way. I want to get photos with every single piece of that roof on there so that later on, if there's a question, well, you know, there was actually, you know, a bunch of missing shingles right here, you have photos. So if it's true, then you, you should have gotten it in your photos and when, you're, when you're doing your scope. Uh, if it's not true, which I'm going to, you know, I love you, Joe, too, but some of your, some of your uh, colleagues in the, the uh, roof uh, storm chasing restoration industry um, have been known to do some things like go back out and rip shingles off of roofs. And I've had claims where that's happened. And, you know, they're calling me saying, well, we found some damage. Blah, blah, blah. And I go back out there and I see a bunch of shingles missing. And I look at my photos and I'm like, I have a photo from two days ago of that very spot. And none of this damage was there. 
explain yourself, right? So that's kind of the stuff we have to deal with sometimes. So um, anyway, so I'm gonna take at least two overview shots from two different directions. So if I get, you know, as much of that roof in a photo as possible, right? Makes This is where I'm gonna say more, more photos than fewer uh, because, boy, this is pain. Um, this helps. Having 15 pictures of the same downspout and hail hits on the same downspout is not helpful at all. Having multiple pictures that show, like, give the file reviewer, the QA, the desk, the desk industry later on, a, an ability to see that whole roof without being there, that's valuable, right? So I'm gonna take two or three, maybe four pictures of, this front, of each slope just to make sure that I get every one, every corner, every area. Then I'm gonna do my test square right here in this big empty spot, right? And then I'm gonna probably stand here on this little peak and get a photo showing my test square. And I'm gonna write, it's, it's gonna say FS or front equals 10, or however, you know, if we're totaling the roof out, however many hits that we had. Generally speaking, if they say, we need you to have eight hits per test square in order to total the slope, then I'm gonna shoot for 10. I'm just gonna find 10. If there's 37, I'm stopping at 10. I'm not counting up all 37, um, right? Then I'm gonna get a close-up of some hits, maybe two close-ups photos of hail damage. And then if there's there are any accessories or roof penetrations on the front, like for example, this here chimney, I'm gonna, uh, Look or I'm going to scope that, of course. I'm going to look at the top of that thing. I'm going to take a picture of it, whether it's damaged or not. If it's damaged, I'm going to write a note, you know, chimney, chase cover, whatever it is, right? If it's metal, it might be galvanized. Um, I'm going to also, if, if it's visible, I'm going to look and see if there's any step flashing um, or a chimney flashing on here that has clear and obvious hail damage to it. If you have chimneys, and again, this is another philosophical, you know, hill you don't want to die on, just because there's chimney flashing doesn't mean you automatically doesn't mean you automatically re replace it. Um, this is that's a you know that's a case by case basis. If it's got damage, if it absolutely needs to be done because it's, the previous installer didn't do it right, then sure. But if it's a normal one, then you can replace the roof around a lot of that stuff. Um, same thing goes for like you know you may have let's see you didn't have that you may have a little step flashing right here, right? Somehow. Uh, or here, right? We're not replacing all the brick so that we can replace that flashing, and we're not replacing the flashing. Um, so, and then I'm, once I get all that stuff, I have my overview shots, I have my close ups, right? I, or I have my overview shot of the, the, that slope, I have my overview shot of the damage area, I have close ups of the damage, show any damage to any roof accessories, or show to roof accessories, roof penetrations, damaged or not. Then and only then am I going to move over to the right slope. And whether I have a contractor chat me up or what, doesn't matter. That's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to do the exact same thing and the right slope. right? So I'm going to do, go around the whole roof and do the exact same thing. And that is pretty much it in a nutshell. right? I have some photos of this roof, so we're going to, we're going to use them to write our estimate here in a second. Um, that's only been an hour. How about that? We still on? Um, no, Joe, it's not bad. You can ask. I'm going to chat you up. I'm going to be asking you questions. You know, you got kids, are they, you know, in sports, you know, we're going to have conversations because it's honestly, you know, just as sort of a side note for the storm chaser and the, uh, for the adjuster who, I mean, let's be honest, we're kind of storm chasers if we're doing cat work, right? That's right. Maybe that right. Um, we're going to be out on the storm for weeks, maybe months, right? So I'm going to be there all summer long. And I'm going to probably run into Joe too more than one time, right? Depending on where you're at, um, some places may, it may not happen. Um, but I'm absolutely going to be um, friendly with everybody. I don't care if the guy was a jerk to me the, the previous time I met him. I'm gonna, we're going to try to reset things. I'm going to be like, you know, hey, how's it going? You know what do we got here, you know, blah, blah, and just be super professional because the person that loses their cool and flips their lid and throws a tantrum in the front yard is the person that, that, that the homeowner is not going to trust. And ultimately, you know, 
we want to make sure that we take get them taken care of and that they believe that they're going to be taken care of, right? So if we're fighting over stuff, then they're going to be like, I mean, would you, if you're a homeowner and like you had, you're a adjuster and a roofing contractor, like yelling and screaming at each other in front, it's not, it's not cool. Um, so, you know, you might have a question um, about uh, what do you do if, if you have the contractor and he's like right there and he's like pointing at everything all the time. Um, you just keep, you say, listen, you know, give me a chance here. Let me, let me, let me scope this thing and we'll talk about what I came up with. If, if he's got a big test square in the front slope and that's like, he's like, well, you know, I have circled all the hits for you already. I'm doing my test square over here. Well, you know, one. You know, if, if he's got his test square right up here where I want to do my test square, I'm going to do mine probably over here, right? I'm not going to do my test square on his square unless there's no place to do it. And then I'm going to start over with my test square at the lower left-hand corner, right? I can't really draw chalk lines on here, but I'm going to start at the lower left-hand corner of my test square, and I'm going to look at every single shingle all the way over to the other corner, and then I'm going to go up one row of shingles and work my way back. Whoa, hey. right? So I want to be 100,000% sure if there's not obvious damage that if I if I have to say no on this roof that I've I've done my I've done more than my due diligence to be confident that I can't buy that roof. You know, contrary to what a lot of people think, cat property adjusters want to buy every roof they get on. That's just a simple fact, and we're going to try to. On the the ones that are good at their job are going to try to. Right. Obviously, we can't fake damage. We can't make it up. We can't say there's damage there when there isn't. Um, but we're gonna, you know, if there's a gray area, we're gonna do our best to try and find a way to pay to, to take care of the homeowner. Right. That's kind of, you know, that's just our that's my philosophy. So, you know, I don't often argue with contractors. Um, later in my career, I never did. Um, we would, you know, we kick off the, the conversation with. You know, the, the meeting with a little joke, a little light banner, how's it going, man? You know, smile, look friendly, look people in the eye, right, as, as the adjuster, and you're going to put everybody at ease, and the, the, the inspection's going to go a lot more smoothly. If you walk up and you're looking, you got a scowl on your face, and you're gruff, and you ignore the contractor. I've seen adjusters do it. You ignore the contractor totally, don't shake his hand, you know, because you have, like, this disdain for contractors. You know, the outcome is exactly as you might expect it to be. Right, so no matter what, even if the person is a known storm chaser, I'm going to be professional. I'm going to be cool. I'm going to be friendly. You know, like I said, even if they yelled and screamed at me on the, on the last one, even if it was right next door and we just did it, got off the roof 15 minutes ago, you know, you got to reset because you got a new a new homeowner here, right? And if that person they're still worked up over the last one, you know, maybe we maybe we reschedule or they send another salesperson out or something, right? If they if they got so worked up and and yelled and screamed. And you just were like, hey, listen, there's nothing I can do. I really want to pay for it. Uh, sorry, I can't. And then they explode on you. You know, there's nothing else to do. You don't don't fight with the people. Just don't do it. Okay. All right. So um, that's about that. Um, and if you guys have questions again about photos or whatever, um, scoping direction, um, what, how many photos that you need, we can we can hit that again later if I didn't cover everything. You're not necessarily looking for like a specific number of photos. You just want to take the right photos, right? And whatever number that ends up being, right? So on this front slope, um, make sure I'm showing my thing. Um, on this front slope, for example, I've got an overview here. I take an overview over there. I might take a one, one or two more overviews from the top. That's four. I've already got my pitch gauge, my uh, layers my shingle gauge if I'm required to that valley so that's eight not eight photos right there right and then my test square overview that's nine then a couple of close-ups 10 11 so I might have 30 to 40 pictures on the roof 30 to maybe 50 photos on the roof and it's not like I'm keeping track of it I'm just taking the photos that I need to take right um, and then same deal on, on the on the the lower parts right Sometimes if the, the less damage that you're seeing, the more pictures you need to take to be able to, to make sure that when it, it comes up later, if, if it reopens because somebody said, well, you know, the adjuster said there wasn't, but we think there is. The desk, the final reviewer, somebody's going to look at that and say, you know, well, I'm looking at the photos and these are, the photos, are, they're, they're not showing much damage. You know, we can send an adjuster out, but I don't know, you know, whatever they want to do, right? But you're giving, their, you're giving them more to work with when, the, when somebody calls in and has a concern about the amount of damage that's on the house, right? 
Okay, so now we're gonna jump into exact to make. Right? Is that what we're gonna do? Um Okay, so like I said before, um which one is this? Is this the right one? Yep. Go back to claim info. So I moved. I go jump in the truck, right? And I'm gonna write this thing up, um, so you guys can see my face. So I'm, I've already done a bunch of this stuff. I put the, the deductible in. I made sure the, the mortgage was right, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a little a shortcut, right? So we're down here to date inspected, right? Let me get that in the center of the screen. When I'm sitting at the house, I'm doing this. Even if I'm not going to write this thing up on site, I'm going to import and label the photos because while I'm still at the house because I might have missed a photo. I might, as I'm going through them, I might be like, oh crap, I forgot to get, to get the picture of the grill cover or whatever it is, right? Jump out of the car and go get it. While I'm sitting there, instead of clicking on the little thing or trying to type in, you know, 03 slash 22 slash, you know, you can go into this date inspected thing and double click it and it'll put in the current date and time, right? So that stops the clock on your inspection, right? These, these hours actually matter. So if you, you know, if, if you, uh, click, it's eight o'clock in the morning or nine o'clock in the morning and you double click that and it says 9 a.m., it stops the clock on your contact to inspect the metric, right? Um, and it's, if, it's, if it was 36 hours ago, right? You called them at nine o'clock in the morning, you know, two days, three days, whatever, two, 72 hours ago, Right. If you if you you know looked at it in the afternoon, that might be longer than seventy two hours. So it doesn't make a huge difference, but in the long run, your your metrics that they track are going to reflect that, and those hours can make a difference between a day. Right. So you might be able to, you know your cycle time might be a day less than everybody else's because you're doing this at the right time. Right. Again, estimators Matthew. We'll we'll say where they claim that. Right. Um, I'm going to go back over here. And just double check all this stuff really quick, uh, right? Just double, super double check, and then I'm going to import and label my photos. And I'm not going to do like all the photos because we don't want to be here all night. Um, and I'm also talking. If I was just doing this while sitting in the truck doing this, I could do it a lot faster. Obviously, um, when you get to your photos, this is what I'm doing first, right? After I do the claim info stuff, um, I'm going to hit load images. This is already on my SD card right here. Uh, and I, this is everything that's on this SD card, that's in, or it's in this folder anyway. All right, so the pictures I'm gonna grab, um, I'm just gonna grab like a handful of these and just kind of show you some, a couple of tricks. I'm, this isn't gonna be an accurate representation of all the, the, the photos that need to be in this file that we took, that we, we talked about taking. Um, but we're gonna go to, we'll say whatever. This is, actually two different houses. But for the purposes of illustration and demonstration, we're gonna do this this way. Um, you'll note, you may notice that these are out of order, or if you don't, then you will. Um, one thing that you can do, a little trick, this little thing up here will collapse the side uh, menu items, which I like to do. Um, you can double click on any image and it'll bring, it'll make a full view of that picture and you can click the, the left and right arrow buttons on your keyboard to kind of go through those pictures right and it'll you know if you go all the way to the end it's going to stop it won't loop back around to the, the first one um, you hit back over here and it takes you back to this view right so I've, these pictures are imported but they're not labeled yet um, so i'm going to say uh, this this photo and this photo are the risk photos right those are always first, and I'm going to put. I'm going to make personally a picture of the house very first. Um, this, and again, this is a different. This is two different houses, but this one has the address on it. I want to show you the address verification. So I'm going to delete those two other pictures because we're not going to use them. Also, I'm going to go through here and delete any pictures that I'm like, ah, I didn't really take this. Maybe I get, one was blurry, and you know I had to retake it one or two or three times. I'm going to go back through here and holding down the control button, I'm going to. Uh, get rid of duplicates. That's these two are clearly a duplicate. So I'm gonna I click that one once. Uh, this one looks like a duplicate, um, and then we'll just say that you know that was a duplicate. And then I'm gonna go up here to delete selected, and hit delete, or I can hit the delete key on the keyboard, 
right? So we'll just do this. Um, and you can hit the tab key and it's gonna go between yes and no, right? A little trick and you hit the space bar or enter key and that'll, that'll confirm whatever you're doing. One of the keys to being fast and exact to make, and really any software for that matter, is touching the mouse pad as little as possible, right? So this is why when Xactware took away all the, there was, there was keyboard shortcuts in Xactimate where you could do anything, right? Not just like sketch stuff, like the, the mouse pad that you get that has like, you know, keyboard shortcuts for Xactimate, it's all sketch stuff. It's not like all the other things. You could hit a, 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 a keyboard shortcut and bring up the activity diary. Let's just start typing activity diary. It was amazing, it was incredible. You could go so fast in the software and then it took it away. Um, I did have a call with the a honcho over at the who runs the the product division at for Xactimate, and he misses the keyboard shortcuts as well. And he assured me that they're going to do everything they can to bring back all those extra ones. And when they do, I'm going to do a huge video on it because you can get through the software so fast with all the keyboard shortcuts that we have. Anyway, so a couple more shortcuts. Speaking of shortcuts, um, I'm not going to rearrange these photos. Um, like in any meaningful way, but I'm going to show you how to do it. You can, you know, hold down, click an image, hold down the shift key, and then click another image, and it'll select everything between those two. Like if you click this one, and then go over here and click this one, it's going to select everything between those two. You can select them individually. You probably know this, um, but hold down control, and you can click individual non sequential images, right? And then you grab the first one, you put your cursor over the first one, this is important, otherwise it'll, it'll get wonky on you. Click and hold, and then you see that there's a little like, uh, it looks like a line with a circle on top of it. You guys surely can see that. Um, that's gonna be, that little line is gonna tell you exactly where those pictures are gonna go, right? So if I, if I wanna put it, uh, let's not do all those, let's just do these two. If I want to put these right after that picture, then that's where they're going to go, right? So that's that's what that little line means. Um, to label these photos quickly, these two first pictures, I'm going to go down here to image name. I'm going to say um, front of risk, right? And I might even say on this one, uh, front of risk verification. I don't know if you need to necessarily say that because it's obviously the ad address. Say maybe these four pictures are the are the back up one step. If you have more than one building, right? So if you have the dwelling and then you have a detached garage and then you have a shed, I'm going to name every photo and we'll pretend like these are all dwelling photos and then the rest of them are going to be the shed, detached garage, right? I'm going to select those four which are of the house, whether they're pictures of the roof or the sides of the house or whatever. And I'm going to call them all dwelling, right? Capital dwelling. And then I'm going to call the rest of these. Hold on. I'm going to call the rest of these other structures, right? So that way, when somebody's going through the photos later, they can see that this, these are pictures of the dwelling, and these are pictures of the, of the, of the detached garage. And the way you're going to do this is you're going to say, all right, well, this first dwelling picture, and you might even say, like, these first three dwelling pictures are front elevation and there was no damage. So you're going to not go in the image name because you just did that with the dwelling. You're going to go down here to description and start typing in um, front elevation, no damage found at time of inspection. And if you can't type fast, there's shortcuts for this kind of thing, right? And then you go to the next one. So you'll notice that now these three pictures have that text in them, right? So you can you can change the uh, the dwelling or the image name and the description by just clicking in those boxes. Now in the other structures, um, say I, th these are all different photos, right? So I want to say like this first one is um, you know garage roof no damage. If I hold down the the Alt key on my keyboard, um, I wish I had a way to show you like this key, my keyboard, but hold down the Alt key and tap the end button. It's gonna go to the next picture and it's gonna post up your cursor 
right there in the description box where you want it to be. So you can start ty immediately typing, right? So you go hit Alt P and you go back. Which hit Alt N after you're done typing in the description field and immediately start typing uh, garage um, right elevation no damage, right? Alt N, um, this is also the garage, right? Shortcut, and it's, it makes it a whole lot faster than. Well, click on this one, and then click down here, and start typing, and then click on this one, and then click down here, and start typing, right? The less you touch that, your trackpad or the mouse, the better. Okay, so really the pictures, like they are, um, you know, you're going to have, there's going to be a, a lot of fun. There may be, depending on, you know, what other kind of damage you find on this house, you know, we got, we'll say 40 pictures on the roof, and maybe five or six or seven pictures for each side of the house, and then some personal property, you know, so it might be 80 pictures, maybe 100 interior damage fence deck stain you know maybe maybe 90 to 120 photos right um, but again we're not counting we're just getting pictures of, of what needs to be in there and not pictures of stuff that is irrelevant or is duplicative duplicates right um, what's next here mm. so all right Okay, so now let's uh, talk about sketch, right? So in Hover, um, I was, was able to export this as a .esx file, which is the file format that Xactimate uses for projects, right? There's .mcx, there's a bunch of different kinds of formats that Xactimate uses for other kinds, like macros, um, diary templates, and things like that. Um, but an ESX is what you want. If you're, if you're in Hover and you want to get a sketch out of this, then you click Export, ESX, get it, or Go, or OK, or Down, whatever it says, right? So I downloaded it already, and it is this one, right? Yeah, so here it is. The, the, it's a different file, right? This is not the same file that we're working on that I just did the pictures in, right? Um, this is just the file that I downloaded and dragged. You can drag and drop. You download it from Hover, and it'll be in a, uh, a zipped file. You extract all, and then you just drag it right onto your, uh, what you call it, your project smart, your local project smart list, right? And then it'll, it'll, it'll import it, and then you'll be able to find it right there. Um, so what I do, there's two ways to do this. Um, you can click and drag and just select the whole thing and you either right click, oops, you either right click and hit copy, right? Or you can go control C, which is what I like to do, to copy it, right? Make sure we got that. Copy, control C. And then I'm going to probably just close this because I don't need it anymore. If it's, if it's open, I might start working on the wrong estimate. Um, then I'm going to go into, uh, what you call it here, and go to Sketch and Control V, right? And it's going to have it attached to your cursor. It's not in there until you actually click somewhere on the screen to drop it in. And it doesn't really matter because that's the only thing that's going to be in your estimate, right? So now you have your sketch in there. Um, that's not a particularly difficult roof to, uh, if, you, if you didn't have access to a sketch like this, a diagram. Um, hip roofs are pretty simple. Angela, um, let me show you here real quick before we get too far into that. Um, when you're looking at a hip, actually, let's be easier to look at this. When you're looking at a hip, the most important thing to do is to look at, is to find the, the tallest point of the house, right? So if you look at this, you can see that that tallest point is actually makes a big pyramid, right? The only reason that there's this all these things sticking out over here is because there's little bitty pieces that are offset. We call them offsets, right? Um, this piece here is an offset of the main roof. So this main roof by itself, let's do one of these here real quick. Um, is keyboard shortcut F, and then hit spacebar to change to a hip, and then it's that, right? That looks nothing 
like what I was expecting it to look like. Uh, let's see, I know what that is. That's exact scope. So anyway, Xactimate just made, made me look like an idiot. Um, basically, there's a thing called, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a video on this, but I gotta get with Xactimate to see how to do it. There's a way to do a, a, a roof scope. I don't know if you guys, are, if you're familiar with Settle Assist or with uh, Stability, um, you can, um, there's a, it has a questionnaire that walks you through everything that needs to be on the roof. It's going to start at the top and say, what kind, you know, how old is this roof? What's the kind of shingle is it? Da, 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 da. And it'll walk through the whole thing. And then it'll create an estimate for you based on the sketch. Um, Aaron tried to show it to me, and even he didn't know how to do it. We both were kind of scratching our heads on it. But he, so that's an aside. Um, basically, what you're, what you're looking at here is a pyramid with stuff connected to it. It's not, this is, I mean, you can literally do this roof in about, I don't know, three minutes um, to you know to get a good sketch on it. And to draw, it's the same deal. You have, that, you have a main pyramid there, right? And then you just have these other things sticking off of it. Obviously, this one's got a lower section um, that may or may not be lower than the rest of this. You know, I'll tell you what, the easiest way that I found to kind of know uh, how simple uh, hip roofs are is that you, when you look at this, the edge of the roof, right? This this run, if it's gutter, this side of the roof right here, right? And this side of the roof, and this, and this, and this, all the way around to here are all, when you're standing in the front yard looking at the house, they're all on the same level, right? So let's look at this. So you guys can tell. This is the same level as that, right? Even though this is a funky, weird thing, it just is a little architectural something that the, the, the guys did the, when they built the house, when they designed the house, they thought that would look cute. It makes your life a little bit more challenging, but, and again, like I said earlier, um, I'm not gonna do a whole big, huge sketch uh, demonstration here to show you how to do that. We'll tell you, actually, this gives me an opportunity, Angela, and this, you'd be particularly interested in this, um, next month, which is April, right? Um, when I was at the uh, Crawford Cat Conference a couple weeks ago, I recorded a four hour long uh, level two Xactimate sketch class. I videoed the whole thing. I got, I got the, recorded the guy's screen and he walked through the whole thing. Um, that's, they, Crawford is generously letting us put that up in Adjuster TV Plus, um, but there'll be, some, there'll be a free couple of a free lesson or two out of that that we're going to post up on YouTube and he goes into great depth about level two roofs um, so it's, it's, it's pretty awesome but again I mean I feel like I, I, I'm not doing a great job of like explaining how simple a roof like this is um, but just trust me that it is <laughs> um, we're, we're gonna go a lot deeper in sketch in some future content and again you can email me and if you want to get it we, we were gonna do a call you know what, Angela? Let's do that. Let's let's get on a call and where I only help you do this, like a roof like this. I think that'll be. We were supposed to do a call. Just so everybody knows, uh, Angela, who's in the the chat right now, uh, we were supposed to do um, a, a free coaching call, and we we're going to jump into Xactimate, but she had uh, unfortunate um, something that she had to cancel. Um, hope everything's going okay with that, uh, but we'll reschedule that for sure. So I want I want to get you taken care of because. It's intimidating. When you pull up somebody's house and you see this kind of thing, you're like, oh my gosh, how in the world am I going to get that right, right? It's not that hard. Um, and if you know some basic skills, you can totally do it. So, what am I working on here now? Um, personally, I like to add in a little bit of uh, uh, some annotations, um, some text. So I'm going to say, uh, uh, this, or I might say roll in front, right? And here's another key, uh, clue towards a keyboard shortcut. Under where it says OK, under the O, there's a little line. If you hold the Alt key and hit O, that'll make it, that does whatever that thing is that it's saying, right? Um, so I'm going to put dwelling front on here. Um, I don't know how, maybe some super, you know, super genius Xactimate scientist can help me with this. Um, 
it says north right there. Um, I've never bothered to learn how to get rid of that. Um, that's not always going to be north. It's not always going to be up. Um, so what I'm going to do, the really only, only thing that matters is the front, which side of the front of the house, and then which direction the storm came from, right? So we'll say the storm came from this way. I'm going to put an arrow. I'm going to drop some text in and say storm direction, right? So that tells whoever's looking at this this sketch or this this you know diagram or whatever that these this is the the direction of the storm it came out of the southwest right something like that um, so that's really all I'm going to do with with this you can build your estimate and do a macro and everything in sketch view but personally I find it a lot easier to do this in the estimating the estimate items window um, you know you can we can hand do this one um, I think that there's a, a couple of power vents there's uh, sewer vent pipes and then we'll just for kicks we're gonna add in like they have Z Ridge they have some high profile ridge that we can pay for and then the shingles um, so we can hand write that right we could say roofing so 30 year shingle right um, so 300 S uh, without felt, right? This is important because you don't want to be, because you're going to be doing, um, let's do this right, put it on the right. Um, it's 300S. The, the shingle replace is going to be bigger than the, uh, what you call it, the felt replace, underlying it replace. And this is a replace only item, right? And it's going to be, you can do squares as the actual squares of the roof. Um, you can click on this little cube thing here and say, okay, well, the waste is. And click on that and click on that and then go in here and click on that or you can do a shortcut and say sq times which is the, the asterisk 1.15 which will give you 15 percent waste and add it to the actual amount right so for the replace right um and then the, per the percentage of depreciation it's a 30-year shingle let's say it's three years old that's 10 percent right 10% depreciation. Conceivably, you could wait till the end to do the, the depreciation and just select all and do a, a thing, which we'll show you. Um, next line item is, again, it's 300S minus, right? So we're tearing off, and it's not with waste. You're just going to tear off what's actually there. Um, we're going to do 10% waste, or 10% uh, depreciation. Um, roofing felt, right? It's plus, but there's no waste with the felt. And again, tabbing down to percent depreciation, 10%, you know, drip edge, um, replace only because when they tear off the rope, I mean, you're just going to shovel the whole thing off. P, now this is where it gets interesting, right? So you could go into your, I'm going to save that real quick. Hit OK, save it. You could, while you're at the house, measure all this ridge, right? This is, this is or I'm sorry, the, uh, the, uh, all the, the edges of the whole thing, right, for the drip edge, um, which you may have to do anyway if you, if you don't have access to some sort of like roof pictometry or whatever. Um, but once you get it into Xactimate in your roof, you can go to the drip edge and we'll say, so it says perimeter, right, 278.92 linear feet. That's the perimeter of the whole roof, including these rake these rakes right here which is the, the gable end these dormer things right so you got your drip edge in there uh joe too might want you to do uh gutter apron which might be a little more expensive right so we'll, we'll uh we'll help the boy out um and then for ridge cap same deal right so it's rfg roofing ridge cap um it's a high profile Right, so we're going to do plus. We're going to do in, in the, the selector code right there, but we're also going to do it's replace only, right? Because when we tear it off, we're just shoveling the whole thing off. We're not pulling individual pieces of ridge cap off because we don't have extra labor for that. Um, the calculation is again, you know, just save that for a second. You can go in there and you can like measure all this stuff, which is the way I did it for most of my career is measure all that ridge, every single little piece of you know, that has a piece of ridge cap on it everywhere, all the way around. Or in here, um, I can also put that in the right place. Um, 
So ripping. Ridge plus because it's high profile um, plus I can go R which is ridge right and it says 43.47 feet now even Joe too can tell you that 47.42 linear sorry linear feet is not a, even a fraction of what how much ridge cap is here right so this this piece right here you know that's it's this this uh Rafter length is 26 and a half feet. Um, that ridge alone, that one ridge right here, might be 30 some feet, right? So that plus over here, you're over 60 feet. So that's it's wrong, right? So what you do is is you add one more to this, right? So we're saying ridge plus um, hip. And that's going to give us 250 linear feet, which I think is a lot closer to how the actual amount of ridge cap that's on this row. And again, 10%. All right, so you can hand build this thing. Um, and if you know what you're doing, you know, you can be pretty fast at it, right? So riffing, PAV, that's a power vent cover. I'm going to remove and replace those because those are, you're not, those are attached to something that we unscrewed. It's not like you can't just shovel it off. There's two of them on there, right? 10%. Um, paint. Let's see if I can do it. Oh. Um, we'll say that those those power vent covers are painted. Um, you could probably do this event. Prime and paint roof vent. That might be enough. Um, you you know, and you do two of those, right? Or you might say maybe there's a large one in there. Prime and paint roof vent. No, there's only one. So I think thirty-seven bucks to paint a power vent cover probably should do it you know it just depends on where you're at um, they may or may not do it you know if it, it was, if it was painted by the previous owner because they you know um, because they wanted it to match the fascia or whatever and they didn't want to replace the vent covers who knows right um, so you can do it by hand this way or you can use macro and there's a couple different ways to, to get it to recall a macro um, you can go up here to the upper left, upper, sorry, upper right corner. Make sure we're still on, everybody. Oh yeah, satellite dish, detach and reset. Satellite dish. Um, upper right hand corner, this little double arrow down. Click on that, and it's going to give you. Actually, I probably can get it. Nope. Yeah. Click on that, and down here it says search or macros. You can use this search function. I have another way to do searches, which I think is faster, but um, you have to know a little bit about what you're looking for in order for, to, to work. But down here it says macros. Click on macros and it's going to show a list of all the macros I have installed on my exact domain. Um, right, so I want this 300, which is my code that I made up for 300S, right, for, for roof shingles, for a, a 30 year roof. I think I've got another one. Um, so I want to double click that and it's going to populate and I'm going to collapse this so I've got more space on my screen it's going to populate my estimate now with every possible thing that you could probably imagine that's going to go on the roof we've got rain diverters valley metal which we have to make sure you know uh, we don't pay for the calibration Joe too. that's the, the satellite company guy is going to do that um, so all this stuff, right? You're not going to use all that stuff, right? So you're not going to have a lightning protection system on this roof. So I'm going to go through here and I'm going to say select those and I'm going to control select. There's no rain diverter. It's a, five, it's a 612, so it's not steep. It's not high. There's no brown vents. Um, maybe there's an 8 inch furnace vent cap. Uh, we're going to pay for the ridge cap, which I don't have high profile on, but I'll change that. Um, no ridge vent. Um, there's a dish. Uh, flashing pipe jack. Just plain one. We're going to keep that one right. Power attic vent cover only. Right? Keeping that one. Um, we don't have turbine vents. We don't have turtle vents. Um, we don't have ice and water, and we're not in a place where it's code, so we're not going to have it on there. 
Um, we can do drip edge and gutter apron. Um, we have felt and then we have tear off. So now I'm going to delete those. So I'm going to hit the delete key on my keyboard and delete those. Right. So now there's my estimate. Right. So I'll get rid of this. Um, valleys. Right. So V A L is the little quick code for um, the valleys on this rough sketch. Right. Tear off felt um, drip edge. We'll say the drip edge is on the eaves only. And the gutter, well, no, it's, we have to have that backwards. So the drip edge is on the rake, and the, drip, and the, the gutter apron is on the eave. Right? So that's going to cover your, if it's two different products, right? Which they're pretty close to each other, honestly. In fact, it's even using the same picture, but that one of them's 13 cents more than the other. Um, power out event cover, right? So you can do the cover only, or you can do the whole thing. Previously, we were doing the whole thing. Probably just want to do the covers. Um, so those are your macro. Now, you always want to put a note in there to say to help people understand what it is you're doing. On something like this, you know, it's as simple as you know the following line items are to um, replace the roof on the door. Um, and we might put a note in there about the depreciation and say, you know. Uh, depreciation is based on the age and condition of the item being replaced. The roof is three years old, has a 30 meter average useful lifespan, and is in average condition. 10% depreciation. Or whatever they want you to say, right? So that's my note, and it's showing up here down here at the bottom. Obviously, that whatever order this is this is in is how it's going to show up on the estimate. So I'm going to drag that up to the top. I can save this if I if I make a big macro. And uh, you guys all know my antivirus is expired, um, and to use later I can adjust my macros. I might be in a neighborhood where everybody only has lead pipe jack flashings. I don't need to sit there and delete split boot and plastic ones or whatever every single time I do this. So I might just delete those out and have like a Omaha, Nebraska, you know, uh, macro, right? So to save a macro, select the top one. This is important because if you do it the other way, it'll, 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 when you run it again, it'll show it backwards. Select the top one and then shift click the bottom one. Go up here to save macro, right? And then you type in 300S Omaha, or whatever you want to do. I always make sure to click off all these things, include attached notes, and hit OK. Now you can go in here and delete this, and it's going to keep these things here. Like, the, whoa, what is that? Um, like a rake, square, square times 1.5, 1.15, 1 right? Um, Valley, th those things that that you when you drop your uh, macro onto a sketch diagram, those automatically populate with the right numbers. But I'm going to delete it and then show you that we're going to find it again. Now I'm going to use a keyboard shortcut to pull out my macros again and show you the fast way of doing this instead of going up here and clicking and clicking and clicking and clicking 15 times. Control M, bring up your macro list, right? So I have 300 Omaha. I can start typing. I can hit Control M and start typing 300. And it's going to narrow down to everything that's got 300 in the title. Arrow down once. And that doesn't work. Double click it, right? And it drops it in. And there's your, there's your estimate, right? Super simple. Now, you notice that there's no depreciation on here. I'm going to click the first one and click the last one and hit, hit Global Changes right here. And then I'm going to go to depreciation, depreciate by percent, and then I'm going to say 10. And then I'm going to hit OK, hit Enter. And now all the items that should be depreciated are depreciated. Tear off is not depreciated because it's a labor only item. Um, so uh, there you go. I mean, it's, it's super duper simple. Um, so from here, what I like to do is to go into my, uh, let's see what I got on my list here. 
Um, okay, yeah, so um, go into documents, report management, and for the sake of like not taking all night to do this, um, we're going to talk very briefly about a, a general loss report, um, which is, let's see, I guess I didn't save it. My general loss report is here. Right, so I have saved in a text document a general loss report. Um, there's two ways to do this. Um, and just real quick before we jump into the two ways, a general loss report is something that's, that could be called your like final or closing report or it could be called a narrative. Um, what it essentially is is just a way to tell the next person that's going to handle this claim absolutely everything that you did and you can kind of use it as a checklist to say, you know, I, 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 you know, made sure that I, I have all the names of the people that I met with at the house, which is very, very important, right? First and last names. Not I met with Mrs. Insured or I met with Barbie. I met with Barbara Dahl and Joe Two from Joe Two's Awesome Exteriors dot com five 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 one three one three. I'm gonna put whenever I say Joe Two in there. He's his the contractor. He's going to have, his phone number is going to be next to his name so that you can call him, right? That's what I'm going to do. Um, it's going to have the cause of loss, um, the date of loss, the when you did the inspection, the cause and origin of loss. If you're doing something other than like a hail loss, um, you may be digging into the policy, doing a, doing a coverage analysis, right? You know, can you pay for it? Um, what can you pay for? Are there special limits? Like if they had a trailer sitting out there, um, like a little cargo, like a, 12 foot cargo trailer, it's, got, it's all dinged up on one side. They don't have a separate policy for that, it was just sitting inside the house. There's coverage for that, but there's a limit of 1500 bucks to fix it, right? It probably isn't gonna cost more than $1,500. So, but you need to look in the policy to make sure and double check, because they may have a special endorsement that gives them $10,000 worth of special limits, limits coverage on their trailers. Or it may be scheduled, right? It may be something that they said, they said we wanna ensure our super duper fancy racing car trailer um, under our homeowners, which I don't know if you do it under your homeowners or under your, your auto, but if you did it under your homeowners, it would be scheduled and they'd say, this thing's worth $37,000, it's this age, blah, 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 and you'd see that on the deck page, right? Um, you're gonna do a recap of your, your inspection, what damage you found, right? Um, other structures, interior, as you're going through your checklist, Wait a minute, I forgot to ask the homeowner about, you know, whether there was damage to the inside of the house, right? If you're going through this, you can call them or hopefully you're still at the house when you do this, which is what I recommend, but um, so on and so forth. Public adjuster or, or attorney representation. If there's a third party, if power of attorney, they have a piece of paper where the homeowner gave them power of attorney, that's third party representation, right? Um, most of the time in the Midwest, by and large, you're not going to be talking to a whole lot of attorneys and public adjusters on the coasts, in New York City, in Florida, it might be every single one, right? Or California, LA, San Francisco, um, and maybe for good reason. You know, I'm not disparaging, you know, PAs or whatever. Um, you know, if, if, if there's some, if some invoices, like say for example on a water loss, you had service master come out and they gave you uh, a water a water mitt bill, bill that says, you know, it's going to be $9,000. Here's all the fans we use. Here's the dehues. Here's the this. Here's the that. The port's attached. You've included that in your estimate. Um, maybe on a fire, you know, you get the, you get his report, right? Because they're going to get that probably the night of, or at least within a few days of, of, of a fire that happens. They're going to have a report. Daily claims, you know, the desk adjuster, whoever you're working with is going to want to see that if they ask you to get it. They may get that on their own if you're, if you're handed a task assignment. Um, overhead and profit, that's, I don't want to get in the, off in the weeds on overhead and profit, Joe too, um, and whoever else is watching this who's, who's uh, has a vested interest in overhead and profit. This is a case by case basis thing. On the insurance side, a lot of times on the independent adjusting side, the carriers don't want to let us pay for overhead and profit up front because they, they want to do two things. They want to have the contractor prove it. First of all, they can't just say, oh, well, you know, there's three trades, you know, they got a screen and gutters in a roof. That's three trades. You know, we need a, we need a, a construction manager and a general contractor to come out here, right? Prove it, right? Do you really need construction management for two screens, a run of gutters, and a roof, right? 
it's three trades, but it's not really three trades. Um, number two is, is, and this is a theory, and it makes sense from a certain perspective, but I think, and again, this is totally a theory. Nobody told me this. This is what I think. From the carrier's perspective, um, they can save money um, by taking overhead profit on a case-by-case -case basis, first of all, on the claim, right? If they need to pay it, they're going to pay it. It's my belief, right? And, and it may be in a lot of cases that some companies in bad faith don't do it. You could argue about that all day long. In our world, in my world, I see them pay for it when it's, when it's absolutely necessary. If a general contractor or construction management is required. Number two, so that saves them money and that keeps people's premiums down. You know, I, again, another philosophical conversation. Um, it's not just about, you know, the insurance companies trying to save money on this side or the other thing. They're trying to keep if people's premiums down because that's where they compete at, with other big insurance companies, right? So that, you know, if so-and-so is paying for absolutely everything, puts overhead profit on everything, their premiums are going to be higher than this, this company over here, right? They're going to be a lot more expensive, right? So your rates go up if the insurance company is just paying for everything really then. The other thing is, is that they save money on our fee bill, I think, and this is the theory part, um, by not letting us pay for overhead and profit up front, make, give, giving us that decision to make because we might, you know, do, make the wrong decision on it. But also it makes our fee bill higher because we get paid a higher percentage of the claim. If it's a $25,000 claim without O&P, and with O&P it's $30,000, I get to bill off of $30,000 instead of twenty five. dollars And so my fee bill, fee bill is higher, so the insurance company is going to save money on my fee bill. That's just a theory. Um, but anyway, that's just an aside. So back to this. Um, so overhead profit, you know, that's a case by case, storm by storm. Your manager is going to tell you. They may say you put overhead profit on everything. Or they may say, do not touch O&P with a 10-foot pole. We'll deal with that on the back end. They might say that, and you have no choice but to do it. You can't, don't argue with contractors. Don't, it's not a hill. That you're going to die. You don't want to die on that hill. Because it's, you cannot do anything about it. It's the bottom line. Um, so I tell, right, interior damage or if the roof needs it, if it's a matching situation with siding or roofing, um, so on and so forth. Um, I would say contents is an important thing to, to keep, you know, kind of in your, uh, in your, your mind when you're doing the, any claim. You want to make sure that you get all of the damage and if the homeowner calls back and says, uh, or that your manager calls or the agent calls and says, hey, well, you know, they did, a, they think they did an okay job. But you know we had all this patio furniture and a grill cover and a grill and a this and a that and a, a you know kids toys and yada yada yada. It was all destroyed in the storm and the adjuster didn't even look at it, right? So you want to make sure you catch all that stuff. Um, loss of use. This is going to be for for if the insured has to be out of the house if the house is not habitable while they do the repairs. Um, subrogation and salvage. Almost always on on us cat claims. This is going to be no. Uh, prior claims, uh, subrogation, just so you guys know, if you don't know, is if, uh, say for example, uh, the homeowner is having some work done at the house and the contractor puts a roll off dumpster in the driveway and crushes the driveway, just destroys the driveway. The insurance company, that's a claim, right? So the homeowner files a claim on that because you know, it's a $35,000 driveway. Um, they file a claim on it. And then who did it, right? The wall, you know, Joe too, with his big giant dumpster that he just threw right in the middle of the driveway. Um, driveway couldn't take it, crushed the driveway. Acme Insurance is coming after Joe too for that $30,000 for that driveway. That's subrogation, right? And they may or may not get it. Um, the benefit to the homeowner in, in, in subrogation cases is generally that they will start paying the homeowner back before they pay themselves. So if they had a wind hail deductible, or they have a big deductible, whether whatever the, the peril is, like they say they have a $5,000 deductible, um, so they got $25,000 instead of $30,000, uh, the insurance company is gonna pay them back the deductible first, and then they'll pay themselves back for everything else. Um, so prior claims you have to absolutely have to make mention of. Underwriting, um, they may have an underwriting checklist, or you may say, you know, insured has a, uh, in-ground pool, no fence, is open to a playground, a public playground right behind. That's a huge liability, right? They need to know about that um, because they're going to they're gonna bring it to the homeowner's attention. Hey, listen, we think this is a liability issue. If you don't put a fence around your pool, we're dropping you, right? A lot of people get dropped for underwriting issues and they don't really realize why. 
Um, so it's not necessarily because such and such insurance company sucks. They dropped me. Well, there probably, there probably was a reason for it. Um, so, and then here we're going to talk about, um, you know, what I explained to the homeowner, um, what, you know, how I explained, you know, the depreciation, um, the, the two checks, right? The, the, the uh, mortgage company, why the mortgage company is going to be on the checks, so on and so forth when they're going to get their first check and when the second they can expect the second check right um, and then so this is a this is a glr the things that are going to be on your and you can copy it let's say you can copy the uh, select all this after you fill it all out um control c to copy it and then you can go into exactimate and into this one and go into uh reports excuse me and go to general loss report double click Sorry, go into here, <laughs> report management, and click once in there, and you're going to see this, all right? And the truth of the matter is, the only time I've ever really done any of this stuff, the only thing I've ever really done with this is some, with some clients, is you go into the remarks here, and you click add, and it'll let you do a general loss report. And this is the last thing you do, right? In here, and you can click inside this field and hit paste. And it's gonna put your whole general loss report in. And you hit save, and then you're done, right? And then you can, um, if you need to attach that to the file, um, you can go into reports and do that. If you need to email it to somebody or whatever, you can preview it um, from the reports, right? So there's your general loss report, right? But most of the time, a lot of the time, and for these days, I mean, you may not be doing a whole lot of like reporting and stuff. This may be the desk person. So this may be a lot more for you folks that are interested in doing desk work. Um, you probably be doing uh, general loss reports, but you're also going to be doing, you know, an activity diary, right? So we, we made our first contact. Um, for me, I am uh, inspecting and closing on site. Um, but you can, you know, if you inspect and then a day later you wrote it up and you settle with the homeowner, you closed with them, um, then you might have an inspection, right? Uh, property damage inspection, which I'm going to pop in there. And Joe, too, is going to be my guy, right? So, for, and you fill all this stuff out. Make sure that you met with, you write in who exactly, you know, you talk to, uh, like I said, Barbara, Doll, and. Joe to from ABC. So all, you put all this stuff in at the right time and everything, and it may be that it's you know a different date, right? And then I'm gonna hit save. And then after I finish everything, I wrote the estimate. I called the homeowner and explained the settlement and all that stuff. Then I might do a closing. So one close file, right? Same deal here. Called insured at 4 p.m. Spoke with Barbara. Doll, etc., etc., etc. Number called. Put the number in every time. Every time. Don't not do it. You think, oh well, it's already in there. The number you called. Put it in. Um, you know, contacted so and so Barbara Doll and explained settlement depreciation mortgage over the phone. Provide seven to ten day expectation for him to receive printed estimate and initial check slash claims packet in the mail. File to close. That's what you want to put at the end, and you can have your you, know, you build a, your templates and they'll have your name and your number on there, right? But you want to say when it's, when you're done with it, close file, file to close, close file on merits, whatever, right? But you need to say file to close in there at the in your last entry. If you need to reopen it for some reason and add more entries, then when you're done with it again, that last one at the bottom of it, say close file, right? Um, so what else we got? So super duper quick and then we'll jump to Q&A. Uh, we'll take a little bit of time to do the q and I don't know how many questions you guys have. I haven't looked. Um, when you're settling up the homeowner, whether you're doing it on site or you're doing it over the phone, the most important thing is is that you you kind of it's part of your spiel. You sort of like answer as many of their questions as possible. So, in other words, um, if you 
if I if I'm talking to the homeowner and I say and I like to do it in person so I can watch their body language because they may be saying yeah uh huh yeah sounds yeah over the phone but if I'm watching them and they're doing this and they're shaking their head no and they're going yeah that makes sense yeah I think that's they're not getting it or they disagree right whatever so I will say you know um, put together an estimate for repairs to your house and I found plenty of hail damage to your roof so we're going to pay for a total replacement on the roof. Um, and that includes all the vents, and I, I list all the things. They're going to have a question, will that include the vents? What about the this? What about the that? That includes the vents, that includes the ridge cap, that includes the, the skylight flashings, that includes this, that includes the other thing. That's a fan, found damage to, I'm going to do a recap, verbal recap of my whole scope. I'm not going to go into the estimate and like say, you know, and no, you know, line item number 23 is roofing, and we're going to tear off to 13.9 squares. Don't do that, just do like a, an overview recap are the things that they're going to be, you know, that they're going to be thinking about, they're going to have a question on, right? Um, the siding on the right side of the house um, has has a lot of damage to it. Um, you know, we t we talked about this when I was at the house. Um, I took a with your permission, I took a siding sample and sent it off to ITEL. Came back as available. You know, I, I the number and the the location and everything of the place that has the the available siding, it's going to be on your estimate. I can give that information to you now if you want. Da, 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 right, so you're going to go through all this stuff. Um, the grand total, right, which hopefully Joe too was there, and I wrote my estimate up, and he looked at it, and we looked at everything together, and we both nodded our heads. Yep, twenty-four thousand bucks is the way to go. That's the number that's going to work right now. We may find something else later, right? And this is almost what I'm going to say to the homeowner. Joe too might be sitting right next to me, and I'll be like, grand total that we came up with. I'll point to Joe, look at him, you know, and just kind of make sure he's he's like, you know, my partner in crime on this. Twenty-four thousand five hundred dollars. Um, you do have a 1% a, a wind and hail deductible uh, of $3,500. We take that off the top. Um, what's left over, uh, we pay in two payments. First payment is what's called the actual cash value payment. It's basically the kind of the appraised used car value of what you have. You know, use language sort of like that. For example, the roof, right? So the roof is a, is a, it's a nice 30 year shingle. It's, you said it was three years old. So three, that's about 10%, right? Three out of 30 is about 10%. I'm talking to the homeowner. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So we hold back. Hold back, which infers that, that we'll give back, right? We hold back about 10%, you know, of that repair or that replacement until you have the work completed. Until Joe too, right here, completes the work, he's going to give you an invoice that says, "Work's all done. We just need the balance due." Send that to us. Joe might even send it straight to us. We'll pay you the rest of the money. We pay him, and then you're all done, right? So the only thing that should come out of your pocket, and I said I said this 10,000 times, like literally 10,000 times. The only thing that should come out of your pocket at any given time, no matter what, it's going to be your $3,500 deductible, and that goes to Joe. Right? It doesn't go to us. Um, if later on Joe finds more damage, um, if we find some discrepancy in the file, the, the, the estimate, looks like it's going to be more than $24,500, call me back immediately, and or have Joe call me, and we'll get it sorted out, and we'll, we'll move forward from there. Right? So we don't say, you know, we'll... Uh, We'll add it to the estimate or whatever. We'd say, well, because we'll it may be something we can't pay for, right? You may really, really want to have ice and water shield. Don't have it now. It's not code. Can't pay for it. Sorry. I want to, but I can't. Right? So things like that, um, you know, later on down the road, we're talking to the homeowner. You know, so you're trying to give them the impression that you're not, that the most important thing is, is that, you know, they're going to get paid, put back the way they were, right? And the only thing that's going to come out of their pocket is going to be that they're deductible. If there's some like special limits issues or whatever, then you may have a slightly different conversation. But by and large, most people want to know, you know, is everything covered? Is all the damage going to be paid for? Uh, what do I have to pay? Is this, how much of this is going to come out of my pocket? Because even though your insurance people, you know, if you're not, you're going to be, and you're going to learn about this, even though the deductible is the insured's responsibility, and if it's a replacement cost policy, then they're going to get, um, I guess you can look at my face. Um, if it's a replacement cost policy, they're going to get the full amount, less their deductible. Homeowners don't know that, right? They don't, they may understand that in theory, but they're scared, they're worried. I don't care who they are. There's there's an anxiety level when you're talking to, to somebody who's filing a claim. They're calling their insurance company because they want, they, they need to get some money out of the insurance company and they're worried. There's so much stuff on TV, so much stuff on social media about how the insurance companies are out to, to hose everybody down and save money on their claim and drag out the process, right? And maybe that's the way it is on the auto side, I don't know. But on the property side, on CAT, 
we want to close those claims as fast as possible and get everybody all the money that we, we can get them. On the independent adjusting side, we're not public adjusters, we're independent adjusters. We get paid more the bigger the claim is. It's totally counterintuitive. If you're, if you're, you haven't, you have to get dragged into a philosophical conversation with a contractor or a homeowner. My very last arrow that I'm pulling out of my quiver is listen, I'm an, I'm an independent contractor. I get a, basically what amounts to a commission on your claim. If your claim is $30,000, I'll make X. If it's $50,000, I'm going to make X more. Okay, so I have an incentive to find all the damage. It benefits me directly, right? So, you know. That's one of those, like, you pull it out if you absolutely have to kind of things. I'm not going around telling everybody that all the time. Because it probably get back around to the agent and then your manager and then you get a phone call, right? But if it's like, if you're, if you're down to it and that's the one thing that'll, that'll set people off, set people who are like really kind of losing their minds about stuff. Oh, well, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, is, is that true, really? You get paid more if, if you find more damage? Yeah, I totally do. So I'm going to find everything I can, but I, this is, you know, that, 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 right? So you, anyway, so that's it. Two hours, you know, minus uh, a few minutes of audio snafu in the beginning, which is driving me crazy. Um, so Q&A. We'll do this for about 15 minutes because it's 8 o'clock where I'm at. Um, let me see. Um, all right, tell you what, let's do. Hey, I'm gonna start from the bottom and work my way up. Uh, hail season officially begins, it depends on where you're at, right? The farther south you are, the earlier it is. You can have hail any time of the year. I've worked December hail storms in Ohio, right? So you, it could be any time of the year. Generally speaking, in the Midwest, Colorado, it's tons of hail. Front Range cities, Pueblo, Colorado Springs, Denver, Fort Collins, they get hammered with hail on pretty much every year. Um, the Midwest, from Minnesota, the Dakotas, Eastern Montana, um, you know, Illinois, Wisconsin gets a lot of hail, believe it or not, a lot of hail. Um, which, and I've never worked in Michigan for some reason, but I'm, I would imagine that they probably do as well. Um, Indiana, Illinois, the whole Midwest, everything between probably like West Virginia and the Front Range, and then from Canada to Mexico, that whole box, pretty much by the mid-May, that whole thing's lit up, right? You're gonna have the Texas dry line, there's gonna be all kinds of like, you know, the weather's gonna be, um, it's, it's gonna be hail season for sure, wind and hail. And you can have wind literally any time of the year, and wind is gonna be, you know, trees blown down, trees on fence, um, trees, Pulling down power lines and yanking them off the side of the house, or pulling the power mast out. You got, you know, they're not giant claims typically, unless the tree like chops into the middle of it. Um, hurricane claims are kind of similar to that, um, but hail season is usually like in full square dance. You know, Saturday night swing, mid May. I'd say if you haven't gotten called by the end of May, um, then you need to get on more rosters. What do I appreciate from contractors? Um, I think, you know, Joe, too, that's a good question. I, I like having a, you know, a guy that's, if you, if you smile and shake his hand, that he's not going to be like a, the a-hole adjuster that, that, you know, gives you the cold shoulder and, you know, ignores you and, and uh, pretends like you don't, you're not there and scowls at you. That's, that's all I really care about. Whether there's damage or not, you know, if, if a guy wants to, like, fight over bird poop and boot scuffs and stuff like that. It's just a simple matter of, I'm, you know, I'd love to, man, but I can't, I can't turn a picture of that in and, and send it in. If the guy loses his cool on it, then that's it's, it's his problem, <laughs> honestly. Um, you know, I, I have to prove the loss either way, right? So this is one th this is probably the biggest thing I would say, aside from like the set, your second to last quip arrow in your quiver before you pull out that, well, I get a commission on the claim is I have to prove the loss, right? Technically, it's the, the insured's responsibility to prove the loss, but I have to prove my file either way. If I'm saying there's damage, I gotta show pictures of it. I have to show proof of it, right? And hail damage, in 23 years I've been doing this, it looks exactly the same. Shingles aren't that much different than they were 23. They had fiberglass shingles in 1999, right? And they had, so it looks the same as it always has, right? 
I have to prove it if it's there. If it's not there, I have even more of a responsibility to prove it because that's when the contentious stuff happens. If I don't doc properly document my file saying, I'm convinced myself, well, I couldn't find it, it's just not there, it opens back up, somebody else goes back out there and looks at it and finds it, that doesn't look very good on me, right? Um, Adventures with Zero, I do not pre-position nearby um, because, a couple reasons, number one, uh, it might, the four inch hail might hit two miles from the nearest suburbs and in the middle of a cornfield. Uh, number two, most of the storms I've ever been on were not on the news, or they weren't on the national news anyway. So it wasn't like I was watching hail storms and, you know, decided to drive to, to, to Omaha, Nebraska because they just got hit. I'll get a call, you know, middle of nowhere, North Dakota. Big hail, you know, little 10,000 people town, whatever. It's not going to make the national. It might make the news for a, a 30 seconds. Um, so I won't. Now, for for hurricanes, um, I'm going to be, you know, if I'm if I'm some the kind of person that really likes to go on hurricanes, which I never really did like to go on them, um, I prefer hail. Hail is 100,000% a lot more fun than uh, hurricanes. Um, but I would get, I have all my gear ready to go. My truck's loaded, fueled up. I got, you know, some things, a bottle of water, and I'm looking at hotels, right? If I have my RV, I'm looking at campgrounds where it looks like that, you know, the spaghetti models have it going most likely to, to make landfall. And you don't want to be like right in where it makes landfall because the hotels might be, you know, all the windows are broken out, you can't stay in it anyway. You go out, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 miles, and everybody that lives on the coast is in, in those hotels, so you may have to go farther out than that. Um, so. Um, they may send you, you know, <laughs> this has happened, you know, they, 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 you have two or three hurricanes or a tropical storm in a hurricane or a hurricane that crosses Florida and does some damage and then goes up in Texas or goes up in Louisiana. They may say, hey, we need you to go to Florida and you get halfway or almost all the or you get all the way to Florida to, you know, Jacksonville or whatever. And they call you back and say, oh, we need to go to, we need you to go to, to uh, to New Orleans or Houston, and you're like, all right, jump in the car and go. So it's it's be ready. You can get most places in you know, especially if, if if you live in the Midwest, if you live in like Texas or Arkansas or Oklahoma or something like that, you're pretty close to most of those places anyway. And it's maybe a two day drive to really any place in the Midwest that you need to go for storms. Um, but as soon as they call you, you go. Um, Dog adventures with zero. That's a good question. I actually did a whole big video on dogs. Um, if you go to adjustertv.com um, and go back, there's a there's a thumbnail, a picture of a German Shepherd on it, and we talk all about mean dogs on the property. So I'm not, I won't go into that one in here. Um, a degree for this kind of work, I do not. Um, aside from maybe getting an AIC and Associates in Claims, um, which you can get from the institutes. Com, institutes.org or .com. Um, they do the CPCU, the AINS, the AIC, and several other things. Um, but you don't need to get a high school diploma is all you need to do this. Uh, school of Hard Knocks. Um, we'll see the tricks of getting an OMP case by case go to. Um, and you can supplement for it all, all you want. That's a, I'm the first guy there. I'm probably not going to be the second guy. Um, architectural shingles have a special ridge shingle. Could be. Not all of them. I've been on plenty that had a three tab that they cut up, or they, they cut up just, they cut a, a architectural shingle into three. And you can see that the appliques are delaminating off of, and that's their ridge. Right? I'm not paying for a special ridge cap on that. Um, Billy Jack, cool scope sheet. I do have an interior scope sheet. Um, it's in Adjuster TV Plus. And I copied it off of Guy Grand's. Um, let me find it. Um, where's the... Uh,
Var mı Scott? Tamam. I'll put the... Let's see. Should be in there. Yep. Another tick sheet. There it is. I'll put that in the uh, chat box here. Um. Um, okay. So adventures with zero. You got some good questions here. Um, when when you get deployed, they will send you where they need you to go, and they'll give you the claims where they want you to do them. So you don't you can't pick. I mean, if you've been doing it for a while and you know the, the managers or whatever, and you're like, man, I really 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 want to go to Gulf Shores because I'm going to Florabama every night, then maybe they'll they'll do that for you. But generally speaking, no. Um, Um, don't so Billy Jack. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a piece. I'm gonna take a piece of paper, or some graph paper, and I'm gonna I'm gonna write down everything that I look at. I'm gonna take measurements. I'm writing it down, so that when I sit down, my estimate's pretty much written already on a piece of paper, and all I gotta do is just type it in. If I'm sitting there like flipping through my photos, ah, I didn't get the measurement of that baseboard. You know, it's I, I don't I don't scope. I don't like to scope. From, I don't scope from photos. I never did. Oh, right click. Hold on. Somebody. Uh, right click, open field, then open properties and orientation. Properties. There we go. Uh, Jeff Shear. There we go. Yeah. Bada bing, bada boom. We figured that one out, right? So you could, you know, well, north is actually going to be that way since the storm came out of the southwest. Pow. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and Bill and Kate. Roof graph. Yeah. I mean, however, I mean, there's there's all kinds of different ways to get roof roof. Uh, what you call it? Um, measurements and ESXs and stuff. All right, so the measurements that I would have taken on that roof if I didn't have the diagram, I'm still on this. Um, I'm going to get the the this length. So this, just purely from a like a practical standpoint, um, this line here, not including this little piece that sticks out. So what I'll do is is, is I'll probably measure half of this. So I'll start. I might be on the ground doing it. I might be on the roof. I'm going to measure from. The, from this corner to the middle and say that that's, you know, what is this? That's 51 feet. So that right there, in other words, so that's three, three foot seven, right? And this is 51. 51 minus, we'll say three, we'll just say that that's three foot and not three foot seven. 51 minus three is 48, right? So without this offset, any, this stuff here, this triangle, not including this this piece here, not including this little area here, is 48 by 26 and a half, which is that rafter length, right? So I want that rafter, I want this length. I'm gonna get this length, and then I'm gonna get, and here's really the answer to Angela's question too. Um, then I'm gonna get that length, right? That little piece across the top, so two foot, we'll say, right? So if you take away all the stuff that's sticking out everywhere, this is a pyramid with uh, 48 by 48 by 48 and 26 and a half foot rafter. Forget all the rest of that stuff off the sides. That's just a straight up a pyramid, right? Then you start. To, then this is this is where this is why this is so easy because all you have to do is just start adding on to it, right? So in order to get this two foot, right, then I'm just going to stretch this out two feet. Um, so now, now that becomes, that says it's 40 foot 11, but that's only two right there. Two foot, 48 plus two foot is 50 foot, right? So this back side, ignoring all the rest of this stuff, to here, if you extend that line out to there, to there, that's going to be 50 foot by 26 by two. 
right? So there's a math equation to get that area. And then I'm going to get this, what's equivalent to this area. So it's 8 foot 2, right? And the rafter here is, tw is basically 25 feet, right? So that is, you're not getting this length when you get this area, right? This length, you're getting the rafter length. Does that make sense? So you want that length, not that length. I don't know if this is making sense, but if you, if you think about it like the pyramid with things that like grow off the sides of it, it makes it a lot easier to visualize it. So for, th for this piece here, um, this triangle gets included with this triangle, right? Because it's part of this slope. Um, let's see, how would I do this? I really only need that length, not including the, the offsets, the rafters, this little piece right here across the top, and then the ridges of all of these offsets. I need those ridges, right? This this pyramid thing back here is a little bit of a challenge because it's, it's it's weird, right? And we'll that's that's not common either, so maybe we'll we'll leave that one off for now. And I'll I'll address that one in another training. Um, but for the rest of this stuff, I want that rafter length because the area of a parallelogram, which uh, let's see where's a parallelogram. Let's, let's show you. So I'm going to use a break tool. Um, I'm going to use the break tool. And I'm going, to, I'm going to draw another offset and show you what I'm talking about. So I'm going to hold down the control key and I'm going to drag out. What the? That's not what I'm going to do. Alright. Exactly, it's making me look like an idiot again. Maybe it's, it might be this hover design. Let's try it over here. What in the world is that? You know what? Scratch all that business. Let's do this. Honestly, we're just going to do a hit, right? So maybe this will help you understand a little bit better. So you have like 30 foot 6 inches, basically 30 and a half inches on all four sides of this thing. To get that little like thing at the top, you're stretching it out, right? So you're adding 3 foot to this. Okay. Exact makes that is my last nerve. Start from scratch. <laughs> Good grief. And just imagine yourself up at one o'clock in the morning and you're like, I just want to close this file and you're jacking around and Xactimate's doing this weird stuff to you. This is where the frustrations come in, right? This is why you gotta practice before you go. So we're gonna start from scratch. Break tool, right? And we're gonna do a I don't know, an offset right in the middle. There we go. Now, if you guys noticed, let's do it again. Um, when I pull this out, this F10 and F4 are part of the same slope. So if you, if you ignore F8 and F9, which are directionally in, in different directions, they're not, they're not facing to the right, um, this F10 plus F4 will equal F3, which is exactly the same, right? So what you need to do to get this number right here, F8, can I get F8? Um, is it, which is a parallelogram, right? And it, the, um, the formula for finding the area of a parallelogram is exactly the same as it is for finding it, the area of a, of a rectangle. It's base, which is one side, times height, right? Perpendicular to the base, not the angle, not the valley, right, but perpendicular to the base, right? So this is eight and a half feet is the rafter on all these. So all three of these are the same, right? So I'm going to grab one of these. If, if the pitch on the whole thing is the same, this is the, the variable. If the pitch is the same on the whole roof. I'm going to grab for this offset, I want that measurement and I want the rafter. 
right? I'm gonna, those are two measurements that I'm going to get, and that's all I need to get to get this whole thing right here, okay? Because all I got to do is say F8 equals this line, this, this ridge right here, times the rafter length, which we, we showed as eight and a half feet, right? So that's six foot nine, which is this, times eight and a half, times two, which gives you both sides, right? Super simple. Um, if you have it where you see this, this business, which tends to freak people out, and, and it's confusing because it looks super complicated, but it's actually super duper easy. Right, this, you're like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do there? It's the same thing. F2 is the same as F1 minus F12, right? Because F12 is gonna be the same on both sides. This, this amount that it's sticking out. Make sense? Right, so all you have to do, you get F2, then you've got F1, and then all you have to do is, is if you were to write this out on a piece of paper, you would say, all right, I need a measurement for F2. I'm gonna write down, you know, whatever this is, you know, six foot plus 33 and a half uh, divided by two times the rafter, which in this case is, I don't know what it is, it's 15, right? So you get that area. It's the same as this, this, this back slope, right? That main area. Then I'm gonna get this slope here, which is still part of the front slope, this little F12, right? And that is five foot eight times the rafter length, we'll say it's 12 feet, so five times, so six times 12 gives me that, right? So the front slope, I've got this plus this little guy, not that, but this, right? And then I have this, F8. That's the front slope, right? And it's exactly the same on the back because you can't, unless they did something weird and had some cutouts, it's identical to the back, right? Um, when you, all you have to do is just remember that for every single thing that pops out, this F4 and the F13 and the F3, that's all the same. It's that triangle, right? Because we, this F3, again, is the same as, I can do that. As, as whatever that is. It's the, the, it's the directional surfaces, right, if that makes sense. I hope that helps and doesn't make it even more confusing. Uh, should be in there. Um, if you go to Adjuster TV Plus, Billy Jack, and look for the water spot training, I'll find it. Okay, let me go back here a little farther. Um, Jackie H, thank you. I saw you, Trucker Jim. Uh, thanks for jumping on. Um, so, let's see. Not gonna answer, question got answered. Jake from State Farm. Um, yeah, ACV, it depends on the state. Texas is going to go that way because they just, they, the insurance companies hemorrhage money on hail claims every single year in that state. You know, it just is what it is. But if you go to, you know, Ohio, they get hail there, but they don't get quite like they do in uh, Texas or, or, you know, even Colorado. Um, it just depends. A a actual cash value, you know, depends on the, the insurance policy you pay for. You can pay more for better coverage. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a product, right? Um, okay. So I think that was the questions that from the beginning. Um, JD, let me tell you something, my friend. Uh, you say you just got licensed this month. Get every license that you can is your next step right now. Get on CIRCON or NIPR or whatever it is um, and start getting licenses because the insurance or the, the I firms are only interested in people who have a lot of licenses um, for desk in particular, uh, but also field because they can send you out wherever they need you, need you to go. Everybody is hiring right now, okay? If you're having trouble, 
getting you know f firms to, to call you back or whatever this goes for anybody it's probably maybe because you just aren't don't have a, a strong enough resume you have zero experience and all you have is one license and you know you're waiting tables you can be an adjuster absolutely but you're gonna have to go get some more training you're gonna have to absolutely get Xactimate training from somewhere I would that I would go ahead and get an Xactimate level 2 maybe even a level 3 certification um, again get as many licenses as possible go to Hague certified reviewer right now or not right now whenever you want to and you can get their um, Oh, Hank Certified Reviewer, use coupon code adjustertv.com. Or sorry, Adjuster TV. Um, and take their trainings. They, they'll, they'll teach you construction. They'll teach you damage ID. It's Hag, after all. Um, they'll teach you estimating and scoping. And they'll teach you um, how to use Xactimate and Stability. And since Liberty Mutual and Safeco just went to Stability, they're a top 10 insurance company. I don't know who else is going to go. Stability told me, or CoreLogic told me that they, you know, they had other big carriers that were getting ready to flip over to CoreLogic. Stability, you got to learn them both, okay? If you want to be the most deployable, the most employable, learn them for sure. You have that stuff on your resume. Call those people back. You know, if you can get on our rosters pretty easily. You can get like apply and get into their system with, almost with nothing. Every time you get a new license. Uh, hey, I just I just want to call and let you guys know. You know, talk to H HR. I just I just picked up my New York license. I uh, just want to like call and, and update and have you guys update my profile or whatever. Um, oh, by the way, you guys got anything going on? I'm, I'm ready to go. Anytime you know, just, just let me know. Okay. Well, thanks. Man. It's great talking to you too. Okay. Bye. I mean, every time. I, I I've got the you know calling back. Hey, I just I just got my level three Hague certified reviewer. Um, I've got my you know it, it gave me you know. I, I picked up my Xactimate Level 2 certification and I know how to use some ability now. You know, I just want to call and update my file with you guys. And call, get on every roster that you can. They need people 100,000%. The labor shortage, the, the, all the extra jobs that are laying around and then nobody wants to work them. I don't know why. It's just, I mean, COVID is the gift that keeps on giving, I guess. The labor shortage is affecting our industry as well. Anybody that's that's an adjuster who's on social media being all cranky that it's oversaturated and you know don't go pick another career because we need people so bad. That person is doesn't know what they're talking about. They're just trying to scare you off so that they can they think that if they scare you away that they're going to be able to get more claims and there's going to be less competition for them. Not true. Not true at all. The good adjusters will always work and we need good adjusters. Period. Okay. So, um, so, um, link, adventures with zero, what link are you looking for? Um, the, uh, I got Hague Certified Reviewer in there, I got the adjustertvplus.com, I don't think I'm going so, all right, my friends. Yeah, and the carriers, you know, Andy's right. The carriers are going to be, they're always hiring, always. And you can get a job at a carrier if that's the way you want to go, um, for sure. It's up to you. I mean, I, I think there's pros and cons to both. Personally, I, I worked at a carrier for a year and came back to being an IA because there's more freedom. I could take, I didn't have to ask for days off like six months in advance, you know, and get, it's just, and then, or you're not get days off around the holidays because I didn't have enough seniority to get. Being an IA, you can you can come and go as you please, really. I mean, it's it's there's some benefits to it. So anyway, um, I want to go ahead and wrap it up because I'm tired and uh, it's been two and a half hours. And hopefully, you guys got something out of this. But uh, thank you so much for watching. Again, um, check out Adjuster TV Plus. Um, we're going to start doing maybe not quite such a scattered version of these, a little bit more focused uh, live streams. On adjuster tv plus starting very soon um the price you guys are hearing about this from me um before everybody else um the price of adjuster tv plus is gonna go up in the next probably about the next month or so um so if you want to jump in at the like the kind of the early bird you know we've, we've been running adjuster tv plus now for a year two years year 
two years. It's been two years. I can't remember. Um, at kind of a lowish price, we've got we've really piled up a lot of content in there. Um, so we're going to start adding. We're going to add a premium tier, and then um, the price of the regular tier that's available now is going to go up just just a little bit, but enough to where you might want to just jump in. You'll get grant if you if you go in right now, you'll get grandfathered in as long as you stay in there forever at the current price. But uh, anyway, if you have questions about that, you can hit me up via email at uh, adjustertv.com slash contact. Any other questions that you guys have, you can reach me that way. That goes straight to my email. Um, and then we can, you know, as long as you're not spam, you can have a conversation. Um, but you guys need to also check out um, Trucker Jim's YouTube page, um, which is very awesome. And uh, he's, 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 was it was a trucker for a long time knows a lot about it and now he's, he's transitioning into being a claims adjuster he's got a great channel um patterson adjusting patterson adjuster training is another great youtube channel he's doing um the scoping and then showing him doing the repair like he's, he's building content where he's i'm gonna do it fix a hole in drywall nobody's doing that and that's that's absolutely amazing go, go subscribe to those two guys um other than that um I'm gonna check check out right now and go get some dinner. So, uh, thank you guys so much for watching. As always, have a great storm.